<laughs> Thank you. Good evening, members. Welcome to the Strategy Planning and Partnerships Committee, Tuesday, 4th of October. The Strategy Planning and Partnerships Committee and the Infrastructure and Public Space Committee public meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any or all contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring <coughs> outside of Australia. The Strategy, Planning and Partnerships Committee acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of Adelaide Plains and pays respects to Elders past and present. We recognise and respect their, cult their uh, cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land we acknowledge that they are continuing, continuing important to the Ghana people living today. Apologies and leave of absence. I know Deputy Lord Mayor Hender has taken ill and Councillor Corbell is an apology and I think is that everyone else? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, confirmation of minutes from the 2nd of August. Can I have a mover please? Sorry. Oh, 6th of September, that's a typo. Uh, Councillor Martin, seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. I'll put that members, all those in favour. Let's play that carriage. Thank you. Uh, for no public forum, no council's verbal report from the from the chair. Uh, I'll now call for items for adoption on block. Uh, we have a couple of workshops tonight, members, so that's seven and eight. I'll call out item number nine. Councillor Martin, you bring it up. Yep. Number 10, item 10. Yeah. Lord Mayor. Item 11. Yeah. Item 12. Item 13. Item 14. Councillor Martin. Item 15, Lord Mayor. Item 16. Okay, so members, I have, can I have someone move please items 11, 12, 13, and 16? Can I have a move please for those four? I'm not having people talk from the gallery. Can I have a mover please for? 11, 12, 13 and 16. Councillor Abiad, do I have a second to please? Councillor Moran. Members, I'll put those items on block. All those in favour? So that carried. Thank you. Uh, we now go to item number seven. We have a workshop regarding Christmas in the city. Page five on new genders. Welcome, Colleen. And Justin, you're facilitating? Yes. Thank you, Provost the Chair. Um, given we've got a pretty um, full agenda today, I'm going to suggest that we uh, take the, the papers as read, um, the circulators, and deliver them in order to um, uh, facilitate getting straight to the discussion. Um, through the um, information that's presented, there are a number of key questions which I'll get Colin just to call out, um, which we're seeking feedback on tonight. So, um, if I can get you to turn, for example, to page nine, which is regarding the vision, outcomes, and audience, if I can get um, any feedback right on those. Please. Right, so we're just going straight to those questions. Lord Mayor. Thanks, Chair. I'll talk to vision. Um, Colin, I understand the vision will inform a, um, uh, a third party um, uh, brief to a third party consultant to come up with and so forth. But um, I'm going to ask this question Is our vision bold enough? 
I mean, if, if we want something bold in terms of Christmas decorations for the city of Adelaide, is our vision in itself bold enough? Um, and I'm, not, I'm not sure if it is. Um, Christmas decorations and how cities position themselves around Christmas is a fairly competitive thing. And what's going to give the city of Adelaide, or what's going to compel the third party consultant to come up with something that really is quite bold and quite defining in terms of its ability to attract people to the city of Adelaide and build a wow factor. So that, that's a comment. Um, I'd also say, the um, uh, such is my mantra, that how does our Christmas decorations brief tie in with our strategic plan to be a smart, green, livable, and creative city? I think it's a lens through which we've got to ask ourselves everything we do through to 2020. Is that how does that brief tie in with that strategic plan? Um, there are two, I'll talk about this more, but there are two things I just wouldn't mind some comments from you about. Is it, is it bold enough? Does it tie in with our strategic plan? Um, probably um, answering your second question first is given that the strategy was um, put together prior to the current strategic plan, I'd say that probably no, it doesn't entirely answer through to the current um, strategic plan. Um, I think particularly around um, the purple of, of green, for example, um, it, it probably doesn't have a focus in that area. In terms of the vision, um, I think that probably a couple of additional words to give more definition in there would make it um, potentially uh, bolder. Okay, thank you. So you would you just you're just looking to feedback at this point in time, you? So you Sorry. 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 Members, hang on, Lord Mayor has the floor. You're, you've got some specific questions there, um, and I would just caution, it's a bit hard to ask the staff the question. Yeah. We want feedback here, the questions around the vision, the outcomes, and the audience, and there's probably um, some depth, bit, bit of a, some feedback you can give on the action plan that sits underneath it. But Lord Mayor, just give some feedback, we'll go around in order. I will. Okay, so there are those two points um, that there is, I guess, the third that I understand that you're looking to achieve some uh, common elements throughout the city of Adelaide. Um, what springs to mind when I look at this and I read this report was three M's, um, mall, market, main streets. They are, when it comes to kind of Christmas, I guess they are our three key assets. Our main streets, our mall, as in Rundle Mall, and our central market. Um, they're the kind of things that probably need some commonality. Um, Recognising that, of course, that the Rundle Mall Management Authority and ACMA might then add to that in terms of their own fine grained approach to the execution of this strategy. But, Colin, are you looking to then kind of have some unifying elements, for want of a better word, so that it looks like we've got a common theme across the city of LA? Is that your goal? Um, that's absolutely their intention with this, um, and at the same time having that that unification, but with the same flexibility that those separate elements can still find a degree of individuality within that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think the main thing, Chair, is that let's we've got an opportunity here to do something bold, um, something that can really define Adelaide. Um, I think the work we've done in the last two years has certainly lifted the bar above what we used to do. So well done. But let's see if we can really stretch ourselves here because you know this could really be something that attracts people to the city at a key point in time, but not only socially, culturally, but of course also emotionally. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so members, I've got Councillor Martin, Councillor Bashaw, Councillor Abiad. Can I just, um, and Councillor Clohan, can I just, um, there are some key questions here around specifically the current strategy, the vision, the outcomes and the audience. Um, and I think the, um, correct me if I'm wrong, looking for some really succinct feedback as to how um, we can we want to review and amend this. Um, members, if you're also interested, I can see that we have um, Amanda here from the Rundle Management. If you're interested in what the Rundle Mall Man Management's views are, we can ask Amanda to give that. Uh, but I'll hand over to Councillor Martin for now. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, I, I heard the Lord Mayor and I uh, read the documents, and, and I would ask the administration, is it possible, please, that when it comes to Christmas, we can ignore the pillars of our strategic plan? 
it is not, in my view, appropriate that the principal date in the Christian calendar has to be green, smart, livable, and creative. Moreover, I'd add that Santa is not green, smart, livable, or creative. It is something that doesn't have to be measured against a strategic pillar. Heresy. <laughs> Uh, and I would add to that um, also, uh, and I am serious about that because I mean, I think trying to align Christmas with a strategic plan is not really appropriate. But more than that, um, I, I remind the administration that uh, in North Adelaide, Christmas in the city means that there is within the CBD an event happening. <coughs> the references in the document that refer to Christmas in the city in North Adelaide are not appropriate. It doesn't need to be addressed. It simply alienates part of the way of our base. Uh, and additionally, uh, I endorse the, the notion that we need new and uh, different installations, colour activity light as it's referred to in here. Um, they're not really reflected in most parts of the city. The mall looks sensational, the precincts look pretty well. And as entrances to the city, as many of them are, it is the introduction to Christmas time. If there's nothing happening there, and you don't get out of your car and walk into front of the wall or drive down the chimney, you clearly don't see it. And additionally, um, uh, I would ask that the same um, substantial effort for North Adelaide put in, be put into those other parts of the city, including North Adelaide, as I suggested at 22, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 8, 7, 5, 4, 3, and 2. Nothing specific there about North Adelaide, but lots of other places. Um, and you'll forgive me for being so corrupt here. Uh, Councillor Michaud. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to uh, really go back to what Martin said, and I actually think that um, the vision at the heart of this was actually captured in the outcomes, which is about the city being the heart of the celebration of Christmas. And so, um, in terms of the vision being involved, it's actually just really what the whole strategy is trying to do is reposition city as being the place that you go for that Christmas celebration. Um, and also, uh, there was a few things which are um, that talk to that even in the actions, and, such as 52 and 53, which was about the bell ringing. And the bell ringing was about really, we've got 43 churches in the city. It was actually about mm. saying we actually have 43 churches in the city. And, so to do a program where you have building is actually stunning if you have it at Christmas time. And also to make sure that that connection with the Christmas pageant is really clear. So that Christmas, Christmas starts at the Christmas pageant and is, um, continues from there. I, I, um, in terms of the four components, I think the four components are perfect for my view. I still think they are um, the areas that we need to look at. And again, I'll pick up on the precinct uh, discussion by Councillor Martin. Um, and I think I've got some other schools here. That's great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abbott. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things uh, in the way of feedback. Um, look, obviously, activation is important, but it's something about tourism as well. So, state government involvement is going to be quite crucial. I remember a few years ago, we ended up having a, a meeting at the ATC. Um, at the time, there was definite interest from them on how we could market Adelaide the Christmas City all around that time. And the interest there, obviously, from a religious thing, is it's quite important, but also from a um, visitation, commercialisation, having people like the city. Um, and similar to going up the other hills and watching the, uh, the lights, uh, for example, and people are attracted to those sort of activations, especially at night, and they can come and have a look at more tourist things the night at the mall or uh, whatnot, which gave rise to a very important question of how much money do you have to spend. Uh, and at the time when we started the whole discussion around that, um, it was we need to put up some serious money and ask the state government also for some serious money to be able to invest in the infrastructure work. Uh, otherwise, everything, all the wishes we get around the table today are really very important. Without money, we're not going to be able to do this. And that's the reality. So, I think what I'd like to know, and potentially the way I think that relates to that, is do we have five, six, ten million dollars that we need to look at over the next five years? to potentially invest in this infrastructure and set it up for the next 10, 15, 20 years um, and keep it active because it seems to me as well that 
uh, we invest in Christmas and other form of um, decoration around the city, but then it's bridges and life. We don't have a process in place to, to buy new equipment, and then we go through a process of four or five years where it's really old. There's no renewal, everyone gets upset about it, but then we invest money and cycle starts again. So I think having a plan over a, a long period of time on how we're going to keep that budget topped up. Now look, I don't necessarily, um, I see Councillor Martin's point in relation to shouldn't be targeted to outcomes, but it's those outcomes that are going to be paying the bills. Um, so necessarily at the end of the day, I want to be able to see some return on investment to be able to substantiate 5, 10, 15 million dollars worth of spending, uh, to be able to see some return on investment. So what is it worth for our ratepayers? What's it worth for businesses in the city? What's it worth for tourism for us? And because I truly believe, fundamentally, if you look at Melbourne, Sydney, and other states uh, in Australia, no one does Christmas well. Uh, and if we can potentially agree that we attract those interstate visitations around Christmas, because everyone has time to come to Adelaide, enjoy the food, enjoy the wine, enjoy the region, and enjoy the Christmas break as a, as a holiday destination in our city, as a must see, but you have to come and see this. It's unbelievable sort of stuff. Uh, this is how we need to position ourselves, and then we'll be able to create. Uh, I guess pre uh, tour down under between the probably October, November through to December, some serious drive around attracting people to the city. And then on a final note, simple things that I've read up about at the time when we were looking at this and we moved the motion a couple of years ago was what does it cost to buy you know 22,000 ribbons in red and send them to every constituent in the city by late the time around the trip? What does it cost to do that? Simple things like that. Uh, where people can be part of the Christmas um, sort of in the city discussion and they can just go out to the street and tie a ribbon around a tree or do something uh, on their house. And this is ways for us to also bring about our constituency and you know, involved in colouring their streets or precincts, etc. Uh, where before in the past I thought we just sort of gave money away to precincts and said, you know, you get 6,000, you get 5,000, 4,000, whatever, go do something with it. And that's helpful, but I think we need to take more of a lead on the top. Councillor Duran. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I think Councillor Abiyak had some great ideas there. I also, you know, one of the first things I wrote down here is, you know, how does it fit in with our four pillars? And I actually said we can still be green, smart, creative. I agree with the Lord Mayor. It's not hard. Just we just need to be a bit creative with our thinking in terms of reiterating um, those those pillars. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask about too was about the filters in terms of what role does council play? Are we the enabler? Are we the facilitator? Or are we just the funder? I think that needs to be specified clearly uh, so that, you know, there are opportunities for shared funding there. There are opportunities for other organisations and agencies to be part of it. And you have made reference to that in different places. Another thing was around the um, City of Music, our UNESCO um, title. And I just wondered whether there were sort of some creative ideas and opportunities around that as to whether we can reinforce that. And that could be something, I mean, Councillor Martin talked about the importance of the squares and not just, be, it not just being a commercial issue. I mean, Christmas is far more than just a commercial <coughs> imperative, and I think we need to acknowledge that. Um, and so, you know, looking at the uh, UNESCO City of Music um, title may give us the opportunity for that, uh, where we can actually activate our squares, activate our main streets. I'd like to see it go way beyond uh, the mall and the market. Um, I think it's an important thing that we actually look at how we uh, incorporate the whole of the city, but obviously the majority of the spend and the focus could be on those central commercial areas, but I think there's room to spread. Um, the other thing I was wondering about too was whether um, it's possible to actually think about some of our local artists. Um, putting in an expression of interest or holding some sort of a um, request for expressions of interest for artists to come up with some concept designs so that we're using the local talent and also it, it enables um, some of our, our you know, tech, tech types to come up with some maybe unique Christmas apps that would also support 
some of the businesses throughout the city, as well as um, other institutions. I mean, we've had very great success with the NAP previously. I think you were involved in that, weren't you? What was it? That was the idea. The AI uh, augmented reality app. Yeah, so I think there's lots of opportunities, and uh, I think we can. Yeah, basically, we need to show how creative we are, show how creative we are. Um, I don't have any issue, and extend it out to the square so that we're also sort of emphasising the livability. It's not just a commercial undertaking. And there was another thing I, I just wanted to say that, you know, it is a Christian celebration, but there are opportunities for other values, such as charity, um, uh, to be expressed through um, our celebration so that, that other people can get involved as well. The concept of friendship, the concept of peace, uh, good health, uh, resilience, whatever. I think <coughs> there are lots of other values that could be incorporated into the into the celebration so that other religions and cultures can participate. Councillor Wilkinson. Um, my thought on this is that um, uh, there's an opportunity to do this in a creative way, to use that word, um, whereby some of our spend for Christmas actually can go toward, towards something that happens year round. And something I've gone on a lot about is floodlighting, something about beautiful buildings. Haven't seen much of that happening yet. So we could be floodlighting uh, beautiful buildings and then and then come Christmas season have you know either moving or dynamic or fixed um, filters that goes in front that then project some Christmas image on one of our beautiful heritage buildings. But the rest of the year, the spend that we're spending all this money on all of this is then permanently lighting that building or those buildings all year. But we can just change the filters and that would seem an approach that would have a lot of impact. It would be lighting up a whole building and you do it with LED lighting and uh, warm colour and uh, low energy. So that would be my suggestion of how we could do something that enables some flexibility and, and utilisation of our Christmas spend all year. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Um, any other members to speak? Can I, if I could just add a couple of points, and I want to speak from the chair, Councillor Moran, but um, something for, to think about, because this is a strategy, and um, one of the things that I get out of this document when I read it is, I think the Lord Mayor alluded to it, that that really bold, I think Councillor Martin alluded it to, that very special bold vision isn't, isn't there. And, um, and, and I look at some of the actions as part of this plan in order to achieve the vision. And I use the example, action one under lighting is meet with SA Power Networks and other key stakeholders to discuss the da 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 da. That to me is not um, a, a part of a strategic plan. That is a, that is a meeting that takes place to deliver an outcome. I think once we start thinking about new ways around how we can actually define what we want to achieve, uh, I just think this could be way more strategic and involved in its context. Um, and I do think that there are some key precincts in the city, and I think um, the three M's, as you mentioned, Lord Mayor, Mall, Markets and Main Streets, could possibly be highlighted great, more greater in, in, the, in the plan as well. Um, and of course, and I also like to see some what success looks like, some some KPIs in here that really define what, what we want to achieve. I know that's my thing, but um, that's just some feedback from me. Um, anyone else want to talk on this? Did anyone else want to? Can I ask a question? Just quickly, um, there was reference made to using banners. Um, and various people using the banners. And I just wondered, um, I think it's a great idea, but I just wondered uh, whether that's an opportunity for artists to be involved. But what is our policy in terms of advertising on banners? And maybe don't answer that, but we just need to check to see whether our policy um, allows some flexibility or and whether it requires changes or not. Thanks. I think ultimately, 
correct me if I'm wrong, we, what we're all trying to achieve is that during Christmas time, everyone must uh, have a desire to come to the city to see what, you know, what Christmas is all about. And it might not be once, it might be two or three or four times based on different events that we have in the city. Um, Justin, did you want to sum up at all? Um, <coughs> uh, just briefly, uh, I appreciate the comments from councillors. That was going to be helpful in terms of informing uh, what we do from this point on. Um, a lot of the suggestions that have made um, do very much fit um, into that events and activities um, umbrella and um, in conjunction with the economic development and tourism um, program, a number of those types of initiatives we can certainly keep up and, and look at um, uh, pursuing as well. The um, commentary regarding the vision, I think that's fine, we can incorporate those comments and the, the reference to the strategic plan, plan pillars whilst it may not necessarily reflect in the vision, it will certainly uh, be included within things like consultants for the engagement of, uh, for the procurement process, so um, we'll take that on board. So, um, do you need anything else, Colleen, at this point in time? Um, no, I think that is, that's great, thank you very much. So is, this, is it coming back, Colleen, to us? Is that how a review strategy? strategy? Yes, we make the changes according to the feedback and then bring it back to council. Committee. And just so, um, in regard to the procurement, yeah. that, that process is still ongoing in parallel to the strategy coming back? It is, absolutely. We've, we've, we've timed it so that there's time for those changes to the strategy to occur um, in order to inform particularly the, um, the procurement around um, actual materials and decorations. Okay. All right, thanks Colleen. Um, now we're going to move to workshop um, item number eight, Adelaide 2040, Kylie Bennett and Stuart Boyd, welcome. I believe we're trialling some new technology in order to give feedback on uh, the, uh, the, the next step of this process. So thank you everybody for the opportunity to workshop with you today, Adelaide 2040. Um, hopefully by now you should have received a text message that was a link to a piece of software that we're going to be using. So if you want to check your phone. Um, if not, we did send a link out earlier today or we do have some devices that are preloaded. Um, for you. Um, so as Councillor Maloney indicated today, what we'd like to do is test a new way of workshopping with you uh, to help us build the scope of Adelaide 2040. And we'll be really interested in your thoughts at the end of this as to whether this is a good thing and it works for you. Um, but just by way of introduction, Adelaide 2040 is one of the 110 key actions in Council's strategic plan uh, that you signed off in June 2016. And really today is about workshopping with you to help refine the scope of Adelaide 2040 because it could be very big or very small depending on what you perceive Adelaide 2040 to be. Um, so since the adoption of your uh, strategic plan, we've been working with staff internally, our executive leadership team, and we've also met with some interested members about what Adelaide 2040 could be. Uh, and we've distributed some slides tonight in the agenda for you and we're not going to go back over those tonight. Um, so today's workshop is really about hearing from all members as well as further refining what we've already heard. Uh, tonight's not about making decisions, we're really looking for top of mind, a bit of a straw poll um, about this particular key action. So we're going to move through fairly quickly. Before you, before you just go on, Carly, can I just make sure um, we just do a technology check that we've so is, the, is everyone meant to have welcome to Michael Mallon's pre presentation? Is that the heading? It's not live yet. Yeah, and live as yet. soon as displays the poll, is that the one? Right? Yeah. Has everyone got that on their screen? Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 Got that yeah. right? We haven't made it live yet. Sorry? We haven't made it live yet. No, that's okay. Just want to make sure everyone's got it open. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So Michael, maybe make it live. Make it live. Uh, yep, yeah, that's okay. Can I send this to friends so they can see? <laughs> <laughs> so 
what we're going to be doing tonight okay. is gathering some feedback from you and we'll be bringing this back to you in a formal report uh, through the November Council cycle. Um, so what we might do without any further ado is have a crack at this. Mm -hmm. um, so the first question we have for you, and we're looking for a thumbs up or a thumbs down, should Adelaide 2040 contain city targets? Does everyone have the thumbs up and thumbs down on their phone? I see. Mark, can you help see? All right, everyone, you've been asked a question. Um, so should it contain has everyone answers? answered? Can you just tell me if you haven't answered? All right, okay, good. We're on track then. We've just got one more to go. Councillor, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't keep okay. going. Thumbs up and thumbs down. Yeah, so thumbs up and thumbs okay. down. It's been a long time. Yeah. Okay. okay. So then if we move on to the next question. So most people indicated that they would like some sort of target in, uh, in Adelaide 2040. What are the sorts of things that you think we should be measuring as part of that? So in this next question, what we what you get is um, three chances to respond. So if you would like there to be a city population target, let us know that you want population to be measured in the Adelaide 2040 targets. You get three opportunities to vote. If something really important to you, submit it three times. Okay, you can vote three times. Three times. On each. So can you hit submit button three times? Yes. That's so you can hit the submit and it's forming a word cloud up there. So population is coming up as something that most people are interested in at the moment. Oh, didn't let, didn't let me do my third one either. They didn't let me do my third one either. Didn't, uh, there's a couple of us who didn't let us do our third. Oh, okay. How do you? I think we've got a fair bit. Yeah. So did anyone get to put in three or did they only get to put in two? It seems like two was one word. Okay, so we've got a fair, fair pitch from that. So then, Michael, if we move on to the next question. Councilor Miranda, did you put your own name in there? <laughs> 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 Why is your name in there? <laughs> Next question. So, let's keep it moving. So, the next question is around the level of engagement. So, if we do a lot of engagement, that increases the scope of the project. So, the, the, this question is around what level of community engagement are you hoping that we will do through Adelaide 2040? Community is general, general public. Yeah, and once I answer, it's clear. Yeah, it's a bit of a answer. Great. Right. Has everyone voted? So, Michael, if we move to the next question. Yeah, let's keep moving. So, so the next one's around stakeholder engagement. So, the stakeholders of state government, um, business groups. <laughs> Big body. 
Okay. All right. Oh, everyone done? Cool. Next question. Next question. <coughs> so in LA 2040, do you want us to try and define particular districts in the city and try and give some overview of the characters of them? <laughs> I think it's funny to watch. Three votes or two votes? Seven for council members. I know, I like it. No talking, just use your thumbs up or thumbs down. All right, next, next question. Next question. So most people indicated they do want some level of district definition. Does it look like the market district plan or is it just something pretty cursory, a photo and a bit of a description? Or is it something like the park plan strategy somewhere in between? <laughs> All right, next question. Um, is the approach and timeline for Adelaide 2040, the build, what you're looking for? Thumbs up, thumbs down? So, the, so on page 32 of the council... Can I ask a question on that? Let's yeah. say someone, someone at fast and someone at long, a longer process. Yes. Well, how do you define down, for example? I would say thumbs down and then we'll, we'll have a bit of a discussion about what it means, whether it's the timeline or whether it's the approach. You need to try and close it and go back in. We're trying. Or if you're not sure. Yeah. Okay, next okay, question. Okay, and the last question is, and this is free text, is there anything else that we you'd like to share with us in terms of Adelaide 2040? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're coming up now. Yes. <laughs> 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 Cool. So thank you for letting us try the, the new way of workshopping with you today. Obviously, there is still a, it's still a little bit buggy in terms of some of the tech, but thank you for um, being generous with your time. What we're going to do now is take this um, and bring it back to you more formally as part of the November committee cycle to get to agree or disagree with this code. Um, so thank you. Um, it, we appreciate you being back here in the time as well. What about this work? <laughs> 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 All right, thanks members. Thank you, Kyla. Thank you, Stuart. I like that. That was that was uh, a good test. Thank you. Okay, members. We now move into items for consideration and recommendation to council. <coughs> Item number nine, Councillor Martin. Um. Yes, I'd like to ask some questions first. Are you moving okay, as I'm printed? Happy to move, I'm happy to move as printed. Now, members, uh, just um, I've got a mover in Councillor Martin, seconder in Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Martin, just, I just want to remind everyone that please, if we could try and keep all up, as many questions as possible before we get into this chamber, you're going to move as printed. But over to you. So, is it okay to ask questions and then speak to it, or would you prefer that I wait until others ask questions? Or? Well, you've moved it, so you've got the floor. Okay, so I'll ask questions first and then I'll speak to it. Um, I, I note, right, I note that um, uh, the interest that's proposed is 3.55%, that is to those who take up the offer. At 24, it is said that low to zero interest rates will keep the take up. So, why is it interest coming to order? We consider 3.55 lows. Can I try and look at the chair? 
you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, uh, we would be able to look at a cost recovery perspective, and obviously, there's a bit of over a 10 year period. We have the uh, Georgia Bay 10 year uh, loan rate, and that's what they come up with is 3.55%. So we provide that as a recovery model uh, as opposed to the uh, interest rate. Uh, uh, yeah, look, I understand that. I, I guess what I'm asking is, it says for us very clearly in the paper that the interstate research that's been done in Victoria shows that the Victorian experience is low or no interest rates. That's been discounted. Why, why did you reach that conclusion? Sorry, um, in addition to that low rate, one of the things that we are doing through this proposal, and there's two options for you, is in option one, to be consistent with the Sustainable City Incentive Scheme, which offers a $1,000 rebate up front, but also applying the equivalent of that in this option. So the Victorian model didn't have that $1,000 rebate up front. So that offsets, in instance, um, some of the cost in relation to the um, interest over the 10 years. So basically, you're, you, you get a uh, $1,600 savings um, versus us paying $400. But so I guess what I'm getting at is that you, you, you have come to the conclusion that contrary to the Victorian experience, by putting a 3.5% interest rate on it, you're not going to give the paper. Chair, we can confirm that we, we, in our view, we've constructed a superior scheme that delivers better, uh, more benefits to the low income and rental households. So we found a workaround that overcomes that barrier. So we buy, we've got a financial model that we're proposing in option one that uh, we've had regard to what the Victorian findings were. We've worked with the, within the council to identify how council can deliver a better scheme by learning from schemes that have been delivered, and, and that is settled on with this recommendation. Okay, and just one other quick question. I, I noticed the same funding is just in 2017 and 18 when it's suggesting we either take up all the bar exceed um, this year, uh, what's allocated. Um, it, it, that's just a thing. I mean, you are going to look at that. Um, yes, absolutely. We will um, look at what the take up is. We're expecting to try and prioritise the really simple application, get some little change out there, uh, and then we'll be working through some of the perhaps more difficult ones where there might be a tenant landlord. Um, issue, or it might be um, other types of um, options where you might have multiple tenants, that type of thing. Uh, and then, so it's really we'll see what happens and then we'll look at what the allocation might be. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Look, I'll speak briefly. Uh, look, I endorse this proposal, um, but I don't think it goes far enough. Um, it, it is, you know, a, a first positive on the road to carbon neutrality. And it certainly beats um, carbon offsets for trees in Tasmania or getting rid of heat pollen from a big reef. But um, best of all, it brings direct benefit to ratepayers. And most of all, 70% um, of those who participated in the, uh, the survey, which is referenced in here, said it was cost. It was the, the main thing that stopped them uh, from taking uh, solar power up. Um, uh, so we're saying to the poor and the disadvantaged, here's your leg up. Uh, we'll help you switch to solar, which is great, and we're reducing our output uh, as well. Um, the savings, too, by the way, look to be uh, about several hundred dollars a year, depending on the usage, so that's great, too. Um, but look, if I have a, a criticism, it is that the interest rate's too high. Um, uh, with the, you know, the current rate um, around 1.5%, that's the, uh, the, the reserve uh, bank cash rate. It is a bit on the high side, and uh, I would have thought we could consider zero interest. Uh, we certainly have been considering buying carbon credits, which don't bring any, you know, a direct benefit. We should certainly consider uh, something much lower. Uh, and the other thing I'd like to say is that it would be good if it were able to be modified in future to embrace batteries as well, uh, because that is clearly uh, the direction in which solar panels are heading. And so, uh, and I know cost is uh, an intent at this time, but for it to have full 
and uh, uh, you know, expected impact, then it should also allow people the opportunity to be that free path. And the other thing is, if we haven't spent um, uh, all of the money, um, then there is no loss, and therefore I'd be saying to the this allocation is a minimum, uh, and the next year should be substantially greater. Lord Mayor. Thanks, Chair. Um, I thank Councillor Martin for uh, moving this recommendation. Interestingly, Councillor Martin's questions were very similar to mine, so I'll just take my support as noted as a second. Councillor Vishal. Um, I also support the recommendation. I, I guess my question was that um, that this very much talks to sort of separate residences and not apartment dwellers as such. And given the amount of apartments that are currently being built in the city, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of this, how we get the developers or the apartment purchasers to actually also look at um, installing solar as the apartments being built as opposed to an afterthought. Certainly what we've found through uh, this engagement with the community is that there is a lot of households that are interested in solar who live within apartment buildings and certainly the opportunity that we've seen uh, for the administration is to help those people to navigate their body corporates, to work out how to get the approval to get solar on their building. Um, so half of our residents living in apartment buildings is certainly an opportunity to support those the champions within their buildings to actually get the approvals they need. And um, how successful have we been there? Uh, we've certainly had success uh, through the existing incentive scheme uh, for buildings to put solar on their roofs. The challenge comes where it's beyond the common areas, where it's uh, actually limited space on the roof, and who has access to that space. Right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Martin, oh, Councillor Perrin. Sorry. Yes. You? Yeah. Um, <coughs> could you please explain the rationale for providing um, 50 cents in the dollar to landlords compared to 20 cents in the dollar to residents who are installing solar? So, so that's the, uh, it's a historical, like, uh, way that the incentive scheme has been uh, provided previously uh, that's in the current incentive scheme. And the reason for the higher rate to landlords was that even back in 2010, I think it was, the council perceived the barrier that uh, it was for tenants, and so the, the policy approach was to provide a higher incentive to encourage landlords, and that's the 50 cents versus the 20 cents. So that's why it's set at a higher rate was to provide great incentive for landlords on the current And has that worked for us? Uh, we've seen some take up, but nowhere near uh, enough. Interesting. And I think I've, I've probably come back to Councillor Martin's comment, you know, do we just go for the, you know, the, low, the low fruit or and the quick wins, or do we actually get some genuine um, sort of reductions through making it easy for everyone to install solar panels? And should there be such a discrepancy between a land, someone who rents the property out to someone else and someone who actually lives in a property? I mean, given especially for the owner occupiers who receive no tax concessions, whereas a landlord would receive tax concessions in terms of cost offsets. Is it, should we, I mean, what would happen if we reconsidered that and made it equal? Wouldn't we get some genuine um, greenhouse gas reductions from more people installing solar panels as a result of an equal incentive? So this Solar Savers uh, program is one way we're exploring updating uh, that, that offer to the community. So through this we provide a, a new pathway um, for low income and rental houses uh, to actually gain an equal incentive. And you're saying if it's a low income house, they get 50 cents in the dollar as well? So concession card holders currently get the same. Okay. And so what's that, what's that amount? Uh, 
So for a concession, for a concession card holder, what's the oh. what's the cutoff point for them? So uh, in terms of um, isn't a concession card holder a concession yeah, card so holder? That's just, just well, what's the sort of income cutoff? What are we looking at? All right, so through this solar savings next phase, we'll actually be uh, engaging with the respondents, the people who have raised their interest. Uh, there are definitions around low income and beyond concession card. Um, so all of those that their conversations that we'll be having is to define low income uh, to the eligibility that's beyond concession. And will that happen before this comes into being, will it? Yes. That review? Yes. Okay. So that's what point four is oh, about. I'm guessing of the of the of the actual um, motion. Point four talks about the fact that the actually is coming back to council in terms of the the rate. Uh, so the, the uh, point four is about just the declaration of the, of the, the charge that right. will be on each individual property that participates. So that, and so, one more. so will the question that cap, like in terms of the low income assessment. Will that come back as part of that, or is that separate? Right, so that's, that's our final, uh, the, the next phase for us is to do a final a work with individual households on eligibility, uh, which relates to the uh, a quote for their property, uh, their specific circumstance, and then an individual agreement with them. And then that's what will come back to council with a declaration on the individual properties and the authorisation of the bonds. So does that mean that you're using your discretionary powers to determine whether someone's eligible for 50 cents or 20 cents in the dollar? No, so if they're a landlord if it's rental, then it, it's, uh, and it meets the, the definition that we set around low income, then they will, the, the 50 cents and 20 cents will be only on the incentive scheme that's outside of this scheme. Uh, so they will receive an, the, um, the incentive that would be eligible for that thousand dollars that would be applied here because with a two kilowatt system they typically will get the full thousand uh, dollars anyway so the the definite way we'll be looking at the definitions uh, for low income which is stated uh, and used broadly within the community uh, so the australian government definition of low income uh, that's our goal and one more question about the barriers that you talked about in the report. Um, and, and you talked here about um, any properties more than a single storey and heritage properties. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. The, the, as, uh, as properties go up in height, particularly when they get to three storeys, there's an additional cost that come in from the installation of solar, which relate to health and safety in the workplace of uh, barriers preventing people from falling from roofs and attachment. Um, uh, in terms of heritage, uh, there's a, an additional cost potentially to um, ensure that we're protecting the townscape character of those properties. Yep, so there's frame costs to locate it behind the frontage. Um, so at the moment, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the priority is to get the first lot of houses off that is just really straightforward uh, and then to work to support the other people who registered to overcome barriers. Members, sorry, I have to interrupt. We need to um, adjourn this meeting and go to open the next one. Councillor Moran, read adjournment, come second, please. <laughs> Councillor Martin, uh, all those in favour, put that. Thank you. Councillor Wilkinson, back to you. Thank you. As chair of the Infrastructure and Public Space Committee, I declare the Infrastructure and Public Space Committee open and call for adjournment. Councillor Slammer, seconded. Councillor Martin, all those in favour of adjournment, those opposed, thank you. Thank you. I'll reopen the Strategy Planning and Partnerships Committee. I'd like to um, move, move on. I think we've covered a fair bit of content. Uh, and I've got one person asked 10 questions. Right. Yeah, are, are, you putting your hand up to, are you putting up to hand up to speak? Yeah. Oh. Um, I don't understand why we wouldn't just go to concession card. Why, why would we have... I, I, Can you I, do I, that? I understood from a long, long list of questions that um, we were not just sticking with the state government's um, description of the low income. Is that correct? <coughs> That's correct. We, we're looking to have a conversation with the community about where that, that should be set, noting that the default is the existing 
uh, criteria, uh, but it's to have that conversation. Well, I, I really don't think we need to have that conversation. I mean, we've got far more important things on, but I think this is a very good thing that we seem to spend 99% of our time talking about stuff like this when our roads are falling to bits and we've got potholes. So why not just keep it, go to KISS principle and just keep it simple? And I also don't agree with landlords getting it. Anybody that can buy another house to uh, get tax benefits is not in my consideration for, and therefore the tenant have, I think there's a great ability there for a bit of um, getting things, uh, I don't think they should get it. And that, that's if you own a second house and you're renting it out, that needs to be in a session. I think this should be wrapped up. No, I'm sorry, Councillor Wilkinson. Alright, thank you. Uh, Councillor Wilkinson? Um, I, I feel that um, if Council is going to spend ratepayers money on on this, it ought to be on the basis that there's some um, shared dividend back, you know, like the council, the council, you know, spends the rate, pays money, but then, then gets a dividend back um, on, you know, on saving of electricity. It's not like heritage incentives thing where the building gets improved and everyone who walks past the retainer and the store building gets the benefit. Someone walking past the house that's got solar panels on it, they don't get any any benefit at all. You know, they get a rate payer from, from this. The owner of the building is and the landlord is, but um, um, I really think we should only be doing it on the basis that it's done to enable tenants who couldn't, couldn't stump up the, the cash to pay for it to be able to council build to provide the funds to be able to look at them. Council only gets, you know, at least 50% of the of energy saving um, back, you know, so getting some dividend like that. Otherwise, we're just giving away right payers' money. But, but, but so, so, Councillor Wilkinson, so perhaps, I mean, maybe I'll just get some, some clarity here because that, uh, my understanding is that is the whole purpose of this scheme. We're giving it away, but they char they're getting charged an interest. So, almost, almost like you know, a loan concept, but right, I'll, yeah. I'll just. You just get you to it's so not it's not on savings for electricity. So you, know, you might be saving a thousand dollars a year for electricity, so the council's not getting five hundred dollars back. You're not getting half of that back. You're only getting three percent of the yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, is that a question or are you just making a statement or well I'm I'm not really supportive of the scheme but I I think it's um the easy mark dividend back. Well, for the ratepayers, I think it could be structured in a way where the ratepayers actually get some more money, money back. So it's current format, I'm more comfortable with it. I think it's good for those ratepayers. Okay, um, I could just clarify um, the intent of this um, scheme. So we're providing an incentive of a thousand, up to a thousand dollars consistent with the sustainable schemes in the scheme that we're providing to resident businesses, etc. Um, the other part of that um, fund is actually debt financed through council and the property owner um, or the landlord pays that back through a new charge on their rate, so in addition to their existing rate over a period of 10 years. And the idea of offering this to low income households is because they have historically found that they can't provide that capital, capital cost upfront to install the solar that other people might be able to. So um, the, the general community won't well, be wearing right, that cost. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's oh, right. Okay, okay good. Councillor Martin, would you like to sum up? Uh, yes, look, well, very briefly, uh, just to address one of the arguments that was raised in respect of passing this to landlords. Uh, there is no incentive for landlords to take up solar on behalf of tenants without a substantial incentive from council. That is to say, tenants of low incomes will have no access to cheaper power unless the landlord is incentivised. And in this way, the landlord is still going to make a substantial contribution but they're induced to do so by the uh, <coughs> level of assistance that we're providing. That is why the tariff is there. And the ultimate beneficiary is not the landlord, it is in fact the tenant, 
who is most likely involved in these circumstances. So uh, with that, I would just ask everyone to support this. I think it's a really sensible initiative. Thank you. I'll put that members, all those in favour. Uh, no one against? That's no one that's uh, carried. Thank you. Members, let's keep moving. Item number nine, um, item 10, sorry, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to move this printed. Uh, look for a second. Can I have a second, please? Mr. Chair. Have a second, please, for this item number 10, Councillor Slammer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have several questions, if I could, through to administration. Uh, and I just want to pick up, I think I was Councillor Martin's comments with regards to the interrelationship between the Solar Savers program we just discussed and the Sustainable Incentive Scheme, which we're going to rename. Um, and battery storage technology. So could you just please clarify the, those interrelationships to the benefits of members? <coughs> uh, so uh, the Sustainable City Incentive Scheme does provide um, incentives for solar, um, PV, and then also battery storage, among other things. Um, the Solar Saver Scheme, we have not um, um, looked at battery um, storage under that scheme because basically at this time the cost of batteries um, in terms of upfront won't actually um, pay back uh, in, within that 10 year period which is what's really required for our low income users. So as the price comes down it might be something that we would look to in the future. Okay, thank you. And just maybe also, um, please, Michelle, just to explain something, and I, maybe I'm reading this incorrectly, but it just seems to have a little bit of uh, ambiguity in the attachment which talks to on page 50. The, could you please explain the, um, and it was mentioned by the members in the previous item again, but the, when it comes to apartment buildings, and in particular, either retrofitting outcomes or new builds, um, because that's where we're seeing the majority of our residential growth in the city of Adelaide, is the new build apartment complexes. Um, the, are apartment solutions included or excluded in this revised program? Um, there's just a little bit of ambiguity in terms of the wording. Um, sorry, they're included, and we're proposing to um, expand it to schools as well because they have a similar built form and common area. Okay, thank you. That's what I would have hoped. Um, also, just in terms of, and this is a general question before I hand back the chair, is that the I received some correspondence, I believe, only last week from a, uh, a person who was looking to purchase an apartment in the city of Adelaide that specifically had electric vehicle charging point infrastructure in the basement of the uh, apartment complex couldn't find one anywhere, decided not all, had to decide that they were not going to buy in the city of Adelaide and in Kent Town. Um, what has been the take-up rate in terms of, because uh, uh, in, in that set of circumstances you don't have a choice, you've either got the infrastructure to charge your vehicle or you don't. Um, they couldn't find one out of the myriad of uh, uh, residential developments in the city of Adelaide. What has been the take-up rate on that particular part of the scheme today? Um, through the chair, we have had um, two applications uh, for EV. <coughs> so, so it has not been a, yeah, a huge amount of Okay. Is that something, can I have a final question, um, Chair? I apologise. Is that something <coughs> which we, when the DAs, when the development of the applications come through the system, through DAP or through DAP, uh, DAP um, are we putting this in front of the development community that we have this facility which could then enable them or help enable them have that infrastructure to meet market demand? Uh, so certainly it's, uh, we're now uh, working closely with development assessment uh, to look at them uh, being able to inform developers more about the incentive scheme about where they're eligible in new developments um, to be able to start incorporating uh, this technology. Yep. If I may add to um, the response that Peter just provided, um, speaking to a number of prospective developers, um, there's certainly a growing number of developers that are actually looking at installing that type of um, facility in new builds. So I think they're actually responding to the market and I think you'll see many more opportunities come online um, in, in, uh, in time. Right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Sanders? Yeah. 
Yeah, I'll do, I'll do a second there, but I've got a question if I can chair through to um, point 10, 15, point 10, page 48 in terms of solar hot water. We're talking about expanding initiatives for hot water beyond solar boosted gas, contact with natural gas or water systems. City has, you know, has been on a longer standing natural gas supporting cities, I understand, with infrastructure and, and, and also initiatives for um, people replacing storage tanks with gas units, um, especially in a place when there's a demand on the grid, and gas certainly helps on that in a big way. What initiatives um, exactly are we talking about? Expanding those initiatives. Sure. So, the uh, the areas so we received some advice that was uh, provided to council um, with uh, the uh, report so we saw some advice from D Square about um, where we should extend these into scheme into so the uh, it's correct that we've historically we've been providing it into the gas boosted uh, solar hot water uh, now looking at expanding into uh, supporting um, electric storage where it's connected to solar PV and there's smart controls that can actually allow uh, the electricity to be, you know, time of day directed to hot water service. Um, because we received feedback from the community that um, it was going to cost them a lot of money to either put in a gas supply uh, or their housing type didn't enable them to have uh, gas boosted uh, hot water. Um, also then looking at heat, electric heat pump. Um, so an important area where there's been a lot of uh, technology progress since we originally several uh, years ago put the gas booster in. So looking at expanding it into other technologies that reflects the diverse build form of the city and that not everyone can actually get a gas supply um, and that not everyone can actually fit a large storage tank or, or, or the like into their, their, their space. Okay. Um, just to follow up question on that, sorry. I just um, want to get moved this conversation along a bit, yeah. No, that's okay. Um, what, what work have you done with the um, natural gas providers? Because I, I understand they still give them a rebate, $500. Um, and is that the reason why we're not offering any rebates? Uh, so the uh, there is the, the existing $500 available. Uh, it was considered that the existing uh, gas support that was, with, uh, was recommended with the existing uh, incentives were appropriate uh, to the gas sector. Councillor Clarahan. Um, I just wondered why we would be extending our scheme to include commercial car parks. Um, aren't we sort of encouraging um, advantage when we own car parks ourselves, why wouldn't we be installing them in our car parks so that people choose U Park instead of um, incentivising others to put them in their car park? Well, that might be a um, consumer competition issue, is it? Or I'll, I'll uh, it could be, but we'll let the expert answer. We've done a lot of work. Uh, in this area, and uh, certain council is well positioned with the advice, advice that we have for council to um, move in this area. So council will hear and see more. So. Okay, and what sort of um, what sort of incentive are we offering for any commercial car park to install a multi-use? Um, electric connection for any type of car. What would we provide? What sort of incentive amount would we provide to a commercial car park to install? So it's, it's up to a thousand dollars if it's a, a, a what we call a level two, yes. which is up to twenty kilowatts. That's classified as fast charge. Right. Um, now the install the cost to that. Uh, uh, so it's a private sort of car park. They'll pay between two thousand and sort of six thousand dollars per space that they want to electrify. Um, yeah. Then, when you get into fast charging, council has set the as before up to five thousand dollars uh, per space because, and that actually is a good reflection of the cost. So how much would it cost for a fast charge plan? Uh, you'd be looking in the order of $50,000. Well, 
for one bay, for one fast charge. Yeah. It could service a number of bays. Uh, for one charge. Just so one. But it's very uh, heavy duty electrical equipment. Okay, thanks. That explains the extent of the incentive thing. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Martin. Yes, thank you, Chair. <coughs> I'd like to propose an amendment as one. Um, and the amendment is, as is, then with the exception of the eligibility of schools for funding under the smart blocks energy efficiency incentives. Oh, hang right. on, slow down, slow down, slow down. You're amending point one. Point one, as is, with the addition at the end of point one, with the exception of the eligibility of schools for funding under the smart blocks energy efficiency incentives. Do you have a second that? That's mine. I just ask you to group, just talk about this specific to your amendment. Yes, thank you. That's all I want to talk about. Um, uh, first of all, Chair, can I declare that I am a member of the Governing Council of the Adelaide High School? Uh, and I uh, suspect I don't have a conflict. Well, I actually will have a conflict because I'll be pretty cross about this. Um, but um, A conflict can go either way, just yeah, so you yes. know. Yeah, um, no, I, I don't believe I have a conflict that I won't be offering to okay, That's your, your call. Yep. Okay. Now, look, I am a strong supporter of uh, reducing our carbon uh, footprint, uh, practical measures to do so. But I have raised this before, and I will raise it again, and I hope that I can persuade people that there doesn't appear to be a solid intellectual argument underpinning this particular part of the proposal. Now, I get the argument that schools have a, a carbon footprint and that they should be encouraged to reduce it. That, that makes absolute sense. But what doesn't make sense is why the ratepayers of Adelaide, that is the businesses and the residents who we represent, why they should pay the schools in the Adelaide CBD to reduce their electricity bill. These schools are the assets of the... I understand. These, I understand. I understand. These schools are the assets of the South Australian government in the main. And there are some privately owned, uh, but they all receive federal and state funding. These are funded already by the federal and state governments. So uh, unlike uh, the residents and businesses of our city, they are uh, being supported. They've got federal and state funding. Now, if we agree to expand this program to state schools, for example, then we're saying to the South Australian government, uh, we're saying to the treasurer on goods and Tonus, uh, we know you pay all the bills for these schools, and uh, uh, there are about five or six of them, I think. Um, we know they are the government's responsibility. We know that they are already funded by the taxpayers of South Australia <coughs> and the taxpayers of uh, Australia generally. But we're going to put an additional amount into these schools. We're actually going to give you a bonus. And in that way, we're going to be probably the third tier of government contributing to the operation of state schools. That, that would make us pretty unique, I think, in uh, cities around Australia. Now, um, at the same time, we're providing absolutely no incentive to the state government to do anything about energy efficiency in state schools. We are saying, hey, don't worry. Adelaide City Council's got a hold of that, Tom. And so he's not going to worry at all. And it just seems entirely flawed to me that we are proposing to fund something that is already funded. And uh, similarly, each and every one of the, uh, the private schools in the CBD are already adequately funded, plus they charge fees, and most of them, I have it on uh, good reports, are doing okay. But if you accept that argument, if you say you disagree with everything I've, I, I've said, and you say, okay, all right, well, no, we'll make an exception for these state schools and the private schools, then you're making an exception for primary and secondary education. How do you then say no to tertiary education? How do you say to the University of Adelaide, the University of South Australia, or Flinders University, we're not going to help you with your power tools because you're a tertiary institution. We only help primary students and secondary students. It makes absolutely no sense. And moreover, then you've got an argument with the Workers' Education Association, the University of the Third Age, and everybody else because you have established a principle. And that principle, in my view, is absolutely flawed. Uh, and therefore, I would urge everyone to support that amendment, which puts the responsibility where it belongs, 
And the administration wants to come back to us and, and say, well, look, we need to do this because there are no similar incentives provided by the state or federal government. And there's another reason why you want to look at it. That's fine. But uh, I am not convinced at this time that that um, it is a viable option. We need to say no. Your responsibility, Tom. Okay, members, we have an amendment. Can I, um, if anyone that wants to speak against the, uh, you want to speak for the seconder? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, that's a second. I think the huge gift that we give, not, not of our own volition, but the gift we do give, is that we don't charge schools rates. And so we forego a lot of income that keeps the city running. Um, so I think the schools do well by that rule, not our rule, but um, we are the, the losers in our bottom line. So I think the fact that they don't pay rates is a big gift to the schools in our, in our area. Um, anyone else to speak to this amendment? <coughs> Councillor Martin, have you summed up the amendment? Summed up, Chair. Members, I'll put that. All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? That's carried. Uh, now, can we uh, go back to the. Anyone else want to speak to the substantive that hasn't spoken? Uh, Lord Mayor. Thanks, Chair. Um, I would just like to commend the, the team. We, we, if we look at over the last 12 months, from July 2015, we've received 132 applications on this program, which 113 have been approved uh, in only 12 months and 19 are pending. Um, and if this, this program chair also has a multiplier. So for the sum total approaching $300,000, which has been approved in partnership with the state, um, uh, is that it has about a 10 to 1 multiplier on the actual investment, which is about $3 million. So we look at it economically, uh, I, I think it's been a, a considerable benefit to the city of Adelaide. Um, I think the environmental benefits uh, stand to reason and sit incredibly comfortable, comfortably with our own strategies in that area. So um, I'm happy to support uh, this uh, motion as amended. Thank you, members. I'll put that. All those in favour? Clear that carried. Uh, I now go to item number 14, Councillor Martin. Oh, we skipped all the others, Chair. You voted for them already, Councillor Martin. No, sorry. Um, sorry, Chair, just give me one moment and page. You found know the answer? <laughs> sorry, someone's been paid to make the book as well. Yeah, thank you, I found it, Chair. Um, and, and I'd like to propose um, that it be amended. Yes, but. So you're not moving as printed, you're moving, not moving as printed. an alternative? Yep. I'm uh, suggesting that one stays the same and two becomes provide provides funding from the sponsorship program budget to assist this request. Um, Are you putting an amount in? Yes, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm just trying to uh, provide $15,000 funding okay. for the sponsor, from the sponsorship program. A budget to assist this request. So provides ten thousand. Fifteen. Fifteen. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Fifteen K funding from the sponsorship program budget to assist this request. Is that it? Full stop. Yes. I'll that chair. Lord Mayor seconding it. Um, look, I um, I second members. I support uh, this uh, financial contribution to Tennis SA um, uh, because. And it is important, and I think the administration identifies that by raising it with us here tonight, that there may be an exception here. Uh, and in my view, it is, and it does meet part of the selection criteria, um, I've lost the page again, um, set out under eight. That is to say that um, it is um, a significant benefit to the city to have this event 
Um, it is, in fact, the only significant tennis event in Adelaide. Um, it attracts a crowd of 15 and a half thousand. That is not modest. It is a substantial uh, crowd. It is a modest gate fee of about $24. But that is, uh, in my view, only part of the story. What it, what it also does, to a, a smaller extent, but nevertheless in an important fashion, it does what the Tour Down Under and the Clips will do. That is, it attracts worldwide attention. Uh, last year, the event was shown on ESPN. And for those of you who don't know that network, it is one of the preeminent sports networks, particularly uh, in Asia, but also throughout the rest of the world. And uh, it's carried on multiple platforms, not just television and pay television, multiple platforms. And it was also shown on the Seven Network too, throughout Australia, throughout all of its affiliates. Um, about, according to the administration, 100 territories in all. And uh, the city was introduced to this massive audience with shots of the facility and of the surrounding parklands. But um, best of all, it, it had the great good of the tenants standing up saying, I just love coming to Adelaide. This is my favorite tournament. Now, that is publicity that is well worth an investment. And I would say also that at this time, Tennis SA is moving, as we've discussed here before, into a new facility uh, with which uh, uh, one hopes we'll be working closely with them on, um, but in which there will also be substantial international tennis events. And I think now is the time to say to Tennis SA, strategically, we actually want uh, to get close, close to you as we were in 2008. We funded you up to that time, I think it was 2008-9. Um, here is a contribution towards what is a valuable broadcast for the state, but at the same time, a signal of our intention to become closely involved with Tennis SA in fostering events that garner world attention. It is eminently sensible to me, and I, I, uh, I endorse it to members. I ask you to please support it. It is a modest sum for a very substantial return. Thank you, Dr. Martin. So what I might suggest is that, that uh, the admin take on notice some of the content that you said around the strategic intent of your work. I've got Lord Mayor as a seconder. Thank you, Chair. I find myself in uncharted territory. I'm uh, agreeing with Councillor Martin on a variety of matters this evening, Chair. It may not last. It may not last. It must be my chair. And... Indeed. Uh, but uh, I, I agree and support Councillor on this matter. Um, uh, in fact, Council as recently as 2012-2013 uh, supported this event uh, to the tune of uh, $10,000. And um, for our objective in terms of uh, quote-unquote internationalising Adelaide, I think this is a key, a key event to do. And I think it's a fairly modest uh, level of uh, support, an appropriate level of support, noting of course that we uh, have some $90,000 in that budget line currently unallocated, so we're not looking to the uh, corporation for any level of funding which we don't already have, so it can be comfortably accommodated. But it is the marquee tennis event, so to speak, on the South Australian calendar, and we don't have many. And uh, I think it's entirely appropriate because it's good for our hotel rooms, it's good for our cafes, it's good for our restaurants, it's good for our riverbank housing, it's good for our city. So uh, on, on those standings, uh, I think it's entirely appropriate that we provide some level of support. $15,000 is an appropriate, maybe modest, but an appropriate level of support. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Abiad. Um, look, I don't uh, have a problem with you intent and the support of the, uh, of the amount. I just question the process at which um, we're dealing with it. Uh, this kind of money, although it's quite low, um, a lot of organisations across um, our state request funding from council uh, in the way of sponsorship every year with the client. <coughs> Some come after the due date or cut off date and we basically don't have the door for them or we don't assess them. And I don't think this is a very good look that somehow, whether it's Councillor Martin or the Lord Mayor or anyone else that's been sort of lobbied or someone's written to them specifically to address this and we're dealing with this outside our policy. Um, so I'm just a little bit concerned because the sponsorship budget is something that which, like I said, everyone cherishes and everyone wants access to it. So I've got a couple of questions to administration first. Uh, 
Firstly, that obviously, um, if it does meet our criteria, obviously this is not, uh, it's past this, um, the application dates, which we all know. Uh, but firstly, around meeting our criteria, we've got a very strict criteria around the constitution. Uh, does this meet the criteria that we, quite, that we have set in place uh, in relation to uh, in relation to our policies? Because it's not quite clear on here. It does say we can support it um, if, it, if, it, uh, if it meets the criteria. It doesn't say if it does meet the criteria. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. 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 Uh, yeah, just through the chair, um, it hasn't been fully assessed against the sponsorship criteria because it did come in late. Um, it would certainly meet a number of the criteria, but unless we went through the um, full robust assessment, I couldn't say it met all the criteria. Um, but certainly some of the items that have been put out by elected members today would be brought to account in terms of that assessment. Well, look, in this case, uh, I would like to move an amendment. Good evening. Uh, I can. Yeah, we have, yeah, that's right. Can I have an amendment? Yes. Yep. So, uh, one is this, notes. Uh, two, um, the administration assesses the current application against our sponsorship policy and provides advice urgently to council on this matter for final decision. And you're deleting the other. Yeah, no, delete um, current two. And I'll seek a second there. Let me present. Um, you have a second there. The alternative would be that we leave it one way or the other and we get advice in the meantime. But okay. Second of Councillor Clarion. Thank you, Councillor Clarion. Uh, well, just to briefly speak to this, um, like I said, I don't question the intent, and having heard the administration speak about uh, the level of support this could have as part of our policy projects. Intent? Of course. No, I'll support the intent of the motion, the initial motion. Just, uh, just, uh, I've just got a quick question for you, just a procedural question. Uh, so this is this is a recommendation that is going to council mm -hmm. to be approved by council next week to then come back to council or are you trying to get no 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 we'll just do advice between now and council so that's not actually what because this is a recommendation that will go to council to then seek okay. the administration so can I just get some advice on how if you want to do it between now and next Tuesday on how we go about that. Because otherwise, this is going to approve this motion on yeah, council on Tuesday, and it'll be another two weeks before a decision will come back to us. The alternate would be to withdraw the amendment, wait for the advice between now and council, and then, depending on that advice, proceed with an amendment at council. Or alternatively, vote against your amendment and the motion and refer it directly to council for separate consideration. So go back to my original suggestion that you uh, withdraw your amendment, it goes to council and in, in the week between now and then we allow administration to send us a briefing well, paper. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I might make it um, yeah, the, other, the other one of what Mr. Um, Beck mentioned. So possibly lead to, as Councillor Martin provides, $15,000 funding from the sponsorship program budget to assist with this re request, subject so to so you were drawing your original, you were yeah. drawing what? subject to, so that way it's not stuck. Yeah, okay. And, and I'll just say, finish it off, and then just put subject to further administration Councillor Abbey has the floor. Yes, sub subject, so as a second, I'm happy to take Councillor Clarion's comments on what subject to council uh, administration, subject to administration's advice. Via briefing paper? Via briefing paper, stop. On the eligibility against the sponsorship criteria? Thank you, Chair. On the eligibility. Against criteria. Against the sponsorship criteria. Second, are you happy with that as a variation? Councillor Clarehan? 
Yeah, I'm happy to second that. We have to second it. We have to take it. Well, I've got an amendment as it is, so let's just let's just skip through this quickly. So can I put the amendment? Just quickly, I just want to comment to why I did this. Uh, I just think it's important and transparent for us to make sure that whoever would like to access sponsorship from the new council, so there's an avenue to do that even after the uh, after a new date. However, it needs to be assessed against the process. That's, that's the reason at which I'm putting this through. Okay, I'm going to put that, and I, can I also just get the administration to take on notice, picking up Councillor Martin's original point around that the, the part, the, the new strategic conversation with the organisation. Uh, members, I'll uh, put that all those in favour and against. That's not sure. Did you vote then? Okay, good thanks. Uh, put that as carried. Uh, can I go to the move to sum up now? Anyone sum else up. wish to speak? To sum up. Sum um, up. Oh, sorry, Councillor Wilkinson. Held your horses there, uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm. Uh, uh, thank you, Councillor Martin, for bringing this to our attention, Councillor Abia, for making sure we go through the due process. Um, I'm supportive of this thing um, because it does showcase um, Adelaide in an international light, and also importantly, it's showcasing the classic players like all the people like that in our classic. Red brick art from my Red brick. And um, <laughs> it's what makes our um, Tennessee stand apart from other Tennessee cities around the world. And that's why we should be showcasing. And um, but also uh, it brings into question other um, uh, things where our policy seems to change in terms of things that we have always supported falling foul of the current wording but the LA60 orchestra which we've always supported is is not now getting funding I believe because well, it's, that's, it's that's, 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 that's not relevant so, to this yeah, topic. But that's some of the, some of the yeah. um, thank you. Right, Councillor Bishaw, sorry I also had you down. Did you want to speak as well? Okay. <laughs> uh, Councillor Martin, sum up, sum up, beautiful, put that all those in favour, so that carried. Thank you. Um, item number 15, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are you moving it printed? Yeah, Chair, I'll move this printed. Second, second, second. Councillor Mayan. Thank you. Uh, look, a very worthy project, but I just wanted to share with the members um, uh, that, of course, this is the first tangible outcome out of the state government towards what we become another project. And, Chair, I note that um, that $20 million commitment over the four years was first moved in 2013. We're now in 2016. According to this report, and I'll seek clarification from the administration chair, is that this project won't be fully completed until early 2018, if I follow the process. So I've really got three words here, sense of urgency. If this is the first project of what may be more projects, maybe more, when will we be fully, fully extending the, the state government, the South Australian taxpayers, contribution towards our parklands, it just seems to be taking forever, Chair. That this is the first project and it's not going to be finished to early 2018. When will the fourth project be finished? 2022? That'll be almost 10 years after this was first discussed. It just seems to be taking an epic amount of time for us to do these jobs. We did a park, a play space recently, of course, which Councillor Martin will soon be opening in Park 9, Park 10, and Councillor Martin's a great supporter of that project, Chair. <laughs> Councillor Martin the is cutting the ribbon. However, that was sent to be expedited in a relatively quick period of time. And Chair, when I read the report, it also talks about the need to do design. And I understand what I have in front of me here is not design, it is a schematic. But it seems, members, you've seen this before. This is the Marshmallow Park schematic interpretation. You've seen this. Um, it's not like we're doing this from a cold start here. 
So there's obviously been done, uh, some work being done in this space. So I guess my question through administration is, is there any way we can expedite this project faster? We have a number, quite a number, as you know, members of public realm projects which we're either doing in partnership with state governments out in Australia or such as Gordon Place we're doing on our own. Um, we just need to get into action, action Jackson move, uh, mode, Chair, so that we can expedite these projects quickly, we can get on them and we can deliver them. And if this is the first one, we've got a whole lot more to come and I'm not that patient, I'm not going to wait until 2022, Chair. So, can I just have a comment from administration if there's any way we can expedite this project faster? Thank you, Chair. Um, Lord Mayor, the um, detailed design of this is now underway. That contract has been let. Um, and the project is moving ahead. Um, not only engagement, the engagement commencing as, as the report outlines. Um, to be honest, we have cut some corners in the usual engagement process. Um, normally, the full engagement process would come to committee, it would come to council, it would then go back. We are in this, that's one example I can give you where we are cutting corners in the process. So it is moving okay. In regard to the remainder of the um, $20 million fund, we are in constant um, discussion with the Minister Dr. Berger. Um, as as you, you'd be aware, I'm very happy to share that correspondence more broadly. Uh, Mr. Rounds recently given um, in principle commitment to another $200,000 to further explore the other three projects which we're very keen to progress. So we're in constant communication with um, the Minister's office on that. Um, Lord Mayor, one suggestion might be that you put a motion without notice for someone does that write to the Minister and uh, chop chop and what's happening and suggest some projects. Because I know that we've got a list of suggested projects already. Um, a second to Councillor Moran. Uh, no, no, no. Oh. Councillor Martin. Um, thank you, Chair. Look, I won't be supporting this. Uh, look, I love kitties and I love playgrounds, uh, and this one looks just lovely. But, <laughs> um, but I just say to members, if you support this, you're actually supporting under the project over all of the uh, the items suggested on pages 85 and 89, which are not funded, as I understand it, by the government proposal. You're actually funding fenced dog parks, central promenade running through the park, linking the rugby porter bikeway with the Fram Street bikeway, rehabilitated creek line, which is a separate proposal, formal park comprising irrigated turf, central plaza that's covered, community courts, nature play opportunities, uh, it, and I guess that's because there won't be a fence on the back of the park. I'm not sure, but we don't do fences on parks anymore. Kitties can be careful there. But the, the difficulty is that I have with that uh, is not only are those additional projects referenced with no uh, funding, as I understand it, but we're also referencing the draft Parkland Strategic Management Plan as being central to this. And the draft parklands management plan has not even been before council. That, so, Councillor Martin, can I just add to what you just to clarify what you're saying? This mm -hmm. has been endorsed by council. We're just noting the consultation. <coughs> and no, I, I understand just, that, that we have endorsed Marshmallow Park, but what I'm saying is I do not recall endorsing a fenced dog park, a central promenade running through the park, linking the road before the bike. I stand corrected if we have. Um, with the Prome Street bikeway, uh, nor any of the other measures that are separate from Marshmallow Park. But the fundamental underlying objection is that all of this re uh, references the draft strategic management plan, which is a document of no status in council. That is to say, it has not been approved, amended, or, or so much as cited within a formal committee meeting or, or a formal council meeting. So and therefore, I won't be able to support it. Let me just get some clarity on that, because how I read this, the engagement, if I'm correct, is it Beth, that is on this one project, those other projects um, are not in the engagement, they are feedback from, there are a list of ideas, basically. Is that, is that correct? Or? Mm -hmm. Uh, through Chapter Cooking to Mr. Cook, with the more detailed part. Are you talking about Table 2? Councillor Martin, is that what you're talking about? 
yeah. or the, the different I'm terms. just saying that we are endorsing, as described in attachment A, which is the uh, the attached document that references these things, um, as well as the information provided as background by the administration, that, that project. Uh, but I, I emphasize again, quite apart from that, it is that this is referenced in the context of the draft strategic management plan for the parklands, which has not been endorsed in any way, shape or form, <coughs> pardon me, by committee or council. So let's just get to the crux of the true question. Is the um, noting is just about the engagement for this one project. Can I get that clarified, please? Uh, through the chair, yes, the, what we're seeking is uh, Council's understanding and noting of the consultation process for this project. Um, and the, uh, the other projects that Councillor Martin refers to are uh, as part of the, um, it, the, the list of potential projects that have been considered. Is that, but they haven't come to Council yet. They are nominal ones in the project, uh, which were included in the report uh, in the Council for approval in July. And uh, that, that's, why, yeah. that, that's why it's coming to you. So I think, uh, look, members, I think what um, is clear is we are noting the engagement process for this one particular project. Yeah, I, I understand everyone's in front of the moment, so please, I'm just saying I won't be sort of me. Right, uh, any other speakers? Yeah, I'll just Councillor I was just a bit concerned about the stakeholder register on page 87, where it talks about whether they're internal, external stakeholders, what their level of interest is, high, medium, low and their level of influence. And it looks like we've been relegated while the minister's got very high level of stakeholder interest, interest, very high level of influence. Council's been relegated to having a medium level of influence. I just wondered why that was so. Um, through you, Chair, just a, a comment on that one for this specific project. Um, the, this project is 100% state funded, um, so Hence, an additional weighting on the end of the ticket. I guess my comment is, I, you know, I understand it's being funded, but I thought it was a partnership project, and I thought our level of influence would have equaled that, given that we've got care and control of the farm plans. And so I just was very surprised that just because the Minister has the money, our level of influence diminishes considerably in this, which I think is uh, not appropriate. But I don't know how that's actually calculated. So anyway, maybe to take that offline to follow that up. Um, Lord Mayor, do you like to sum up? I will sum up, please, Chair. Um, look, I, I, I endorse and support the recommendation. My comments, Chair, are about uh, let's expedite these projects with a sense of urgency. That's what. That's my mantra here. Um, I don't <coughs> agree with uh, Councillor Martin's comments. I must say, Chair. It's uh, I understand. Normal. I understand and respect that we've got a draft parkland management strategy before us, but that's like saying DAP should not consider any matters whilst the regulations are being written for the planning bill 2015. Life does not stop members. We need to get on with it. We have got a myriad of projects in the city of Adelaide, four to come in the parklands. We've got Border Place, we've got North Terrace, we've got the laneway project between the Adelaide Central Market and Riverbank, we've got our cycling project. Let's get on with these projects with a great sense of urgency. That's what I'm saying. So, no, I don't agree with Councillor Martin. I think that uh, whilst the Parklands Management Strategy Review is incredibly important, it doesn't mean we need to freeze uh, making decisions about progressing our city. So I commend this to you, members. Let's get on with the job. Remember, uh, put that. All those in favour? Anyone against? Play that, Karen. Thank you. Um, members, I've got to ask. Other business have a, is it, is it a question or a motion? motion? Motion without notice from Councillor Antic. Just seconding it. Oh, you've got a nice one. Um, it was circulated. Yes, it's been circulated to everyone by email, but I'll just give members a couple of seconds to read it. I'm asking that the strategy and Councillor Moran is seconding it. Committee recommends the council that are 
the, the one report being prepared detailing the total financial impact of the Corporation of the City of Adelaide of the statewide blackout on Wednesday, 28 September 2016, which affected the CBD in North Adelaide, and two, that legal advice be obtained in relation to whether the Corporation of the City of Adelaide can seek compensation for the said losses, and I seek a second. And that's Councillor Moran. You have the floor. Oh, good. Twice. Okay, well, on Wednesday of last week, uh, our entire state was uh, put into blackout. Um, so you might know that. Uh, city businesses and households alike were essentially left to the mercy of our power, power grid. And I just, I, I do want to start because it's um, important to note that I want to congratulate our staff in relation to the way, manner in which they handled the chaos which was imposed upon the city. Um, I think once again, the city of Adelaide is led from the front in relation to its response, opening new park stations, generally lending assistance to commuters, ratepayers, and businesses. So I think that was outstanding. Um, I'd originally drafted this motion um, to include a request for recommendations from the staff in relation to what we could do to assist in mitigating future disruptions. But on reflection, I, I looked at it and I thought, well, I think that's an almost impossible task because the city, like the entire state, is vulnerable um, to such outages and there's really no power generator big enough to, to lock down an entire state for uh, hours and hours on end as we saw on the on Wednesday, um, when we uh, when we saw what could be described as the mother of all Earth hours, in actual fact, it's probably five consecutive Earth hours, which was almost a record, I think. So, um, but what is critical for a power network is safe, reliable, and sustainable energy. But unfortunately, on Wednesday, it failed on all counts. Um, in fact, this morning we're told by the, no, the ABC, no less, that the Minister for Energy warned of potential problems in July, noting that the electrical security was quote a complex matter. Uh, it's also reported in the Australian this morning that the lack of confidence in the grid has now caused the HP and Oz Minerals at Olympic Dam and from the Hill to consider installing a, a kill switch to protect them from potential voltage collapse. So I wonder what the likelihood of those sorts of problems arising in the city of Adelaide is. And, and it's, it's certainly far better for me to um, conclude the cause of the blackout. That's a job for the experts. But there are clearly significant challenges. And I, can, I think I can simply say that it's completely unacceptable that uh, an event or occurrence like this could knock out the electricity supply to an entire state, including its capital city, for this long. And it's equally unacceptable that households and businesses of the city of Adelaide were left in the dark for many hours and that large portions of the state did so also. And quite how this is conducive to providing an environment which will attract businesses to the city, let alone in other parts of the state beyond me. And, uh, and I, I know that my colleagues all share my uh, understanding that the primary responsibility of council is not to speak on behalf of people of the state, include all other states, but mainly for the rent ratepayers in the city of Adelaide, who um, will have to make up their own minds as to whether or not there are civil claims or claims against their insurers for business interruption losses or property damage. And they're separate issues from those which face the corporation of the city of Adelaide, which is why it's phrased in that manner. Um, but it is clear that the city of Adelaide did sustain financial losses in this event. The question really is how much and who, who pays, whether somebody does need to pay. Um, and that's the question I'm asking. So um, we know that council opened its gates to the U parks manually to let people out. And we know that there would have been administrative costs and potentially business interruption losses from the swim centre and other such. Uh, uh, such assets. And I know that everyone here, of course, is very concerned, like I am, about fiscal responsibility. Um, I know this because we spent something like 45 minutes arguing about a $35,000 piece of public art to house the person in the new lock. Um, so I'm sure, yeah, which rings and resonates, uh, I'm sure that all will share the concern, as I do, regarding the cost of the corporation, this um, five hour long carbon neutral event enforced upon us last week. So what I'm asking for is simply we prepare a report as to the total financial impact and then we seek advice as to whether that cost can be recovered and um, seek your support. Councillor Moran, a seconder. I'm going to reserve my right. Councillor Abiyan. Oh yeah. <coughs> Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, I support this too because we, we need to be able to quantify the damage uh, that was done uh, to council assets. Uh, including our commercial assets as a result of the, uh, the blackout. It was a collapse, in fact. And, and in doing so, we'll be mirroring what other uh, outfits are doing. I mean, Arium, for example, has uh, apparently, uh, it's reported, lost millions because of this. And so no doubt it too will be looking at its options. But uh, understanding the costs better also helps us to plan uh, to actually work out which of the assets require the uh, strategic approach to make sure that they are uh, protected. And yes, uh, the legal advice works for me as well. I've heard the arguments about the uh, reliance on 
renewables and the other argument about no uh, system in the world could have withstood the event. But uh, Chair, there is also a substantial argument that we have uh, a vulnerable system, uh, that there is a problem, uh, there was a problem, and therefore there may be uh, culpability. And I note uh, that uh, our colleagues in the media in Zadi today are asking the questions we all are. Um, why couldn't that outage be contained? Why did the whole state black out from events hundreds of kilometres away? Why is our long transmission network not compartmentalised? These are all very serious questions and they do point to the need, the need for some kind of uh, uh, legal advice about how we proceed. And I might just add that, you know, it doesn't matter how many gigabytes we offer business customers, it doesn't matter how many advertisements we make saying what a great place this is. It doesn't matter how many trips the law mayor makes to China to attract investment. If the view is that you cannot conduct a life or a business in this place without fear of the power network collapsing, it is absolutely wasted. Um, it, it has been described as uh, Jay's Black Day. Well, it may turn out to be a very black day for the city of Adelaide. And advice about quantifying the loss that we've sustained and whether it is possible to take them out further seems to me to be sensible. Any other speakers to this? Lord Mayor and um, um, the second to speak and then I'll go to Lord Mayor. Uh, yes, look, the damage to, um, to Adelaide's um, reputation, I think is reflected humorously in the uh, world news that Southstone had been evacuated um, on that day. Um, which makes us sound like um, a tin forty third world country that can't keep its power going. Um, I've never seen, I don't think anybody's service ever well, has never happened before now at a, a blackout such as this. And it's understandable on, on very bad weather for a, I've seen complete blackouts for about five minutes, things like that. It's understandable in extreme weather conditions to have a blackout and a widespread blackout. But to have it, I don't think Melrose is still back on the grid. To have it last this long smacks of an incompetent system um, that we have never seen before. Also, what I um, noticed this time, we've always proudly said in the city of Adelaide, North Adelaide, that uh, we never, we never get a blackout for more than five minutes because of the Women's and Children's Hospital and the Royal Adelaide Hospital. It was a convention and well known fact that, and boasted by extra at the time, that we'd never let the city go out. I think it stemmed from the old days of iron lungs and and so forth, and people on ventilators. Um, that clearly, that convention has clearly not survived the, um, the revolution in our power. And while we were on quickly, um, as I sent the message to the Lord Mayor, um, Elizabeth West, Elizabeth and Craigmore were on a long time before we are. So obviously keeping the city lit and powered is no longer a priority or a possibility in this new setup, which is which is very disappointing, and I think we should uh, we suffer the reputation of damage from that. We need to know what the cost is, and need to um, seek reparations. Um, to say that this was caused by a once in a lifetime weather event is ridiculous, and we don't mm -hmm. cite funds all the time. They don't lose their power for more than five minutes. Um, this is a shambolic system that is not um, because of renewables, it's been clearly explained in the paper, but it's the way the renewables and the power network is set up now. It's not compartmentalised and we have now probably can expect these work, these complete across the states blackouts again because there will be further back weather. Um, so I commend this. Um, motion. Um, I don't think it's um, unfair for us to ask for this, and I don't think it's unfair for us to look long term to be compensated for what the damage to, to our data is happening. Lord Mayor. Uh, <coughs> Chair, I'm going to move to amend uh, by striking out point two, and I seek a second, and I'll explain why. Do I have a second, oh, Councillor I need to move the amendment. I'll Thanks, Councillor. Um, I would very much be interested to know what the financial impact was on the city of Adelaide, and then would be happy to then reserve a right to make a decision about what steps thereafter. But I think for this council members to straight off the bat 
go out and seek legal advice is an aggressive move. Uh, if we had 68 local government areas around South Australia in their council chambers this evening having this debate about seeking legal advice with regards to seeking compensation, uh, I don't think it sounds a sounds very positive message about any sense of unity in South Australia at all. And it concerns me. So I would like, as much as you may, to see uh, this quantified uh, by administration as much of their ability as possible to get a sense of what the economic loss was. Uh, and then we can reserve our right to make a decision about where to from then. But I think for us to go straight to legal advice on this matter is an inappropriate thing to do. Many councils will be looking for us and do look to us, being the Capital City Council, for leadership on a whole range of matters. And if our first response members is to call the lawyers, um, what type of message is that sending out with regards to what ostensibly is a state of emergency? No. no. Our members. Well, members, let me finish. There were 23 energy towers uh, fallen as a result of high wind. Uh, we know that. We know that then that sent the system into shutdown. Uh, the system through a mechanism of self-preservation then begins to uh, progressively shut down in order to no, take the balance of the system. So you know this. Yeah, members, let's stick so, to the topic. Members, what I'm suggesting is the first part of this motion I, um, I support. I would like to see uh, the uh, economic loss quantified to much as our ability. But for us members to be picking up the phone and calling the lawyers, what message does that send? to 67 other councillors around South Australia. I urge you to think about that. Members, I just remind you, we are talking specifically only to the amendment about the legal advice component, part two. Councillor Corahan is the seconder. I, I agree with the Lord Mayor. I think um, it's going one step too far uh, at, this mo at this time to be asking um, about legal advice. I mean, it could very well happen one day where, you know, we've got our ratepayers asking about getting legal advice about how they can be recompensed by Adelaide City Council. It's not too far away. Well, you know, if that's the way we're going to deal with natural disasters, we're in for a long litigation or a process of litigation. I think it's really what is important, what is most important about this is about really us finding out, not not doing stuff that's going to happen anyway, but don't, I mean, let's not worry about it. The state government and the opposition will be right in there uh, with a lot of argy-bargy. The federal government will be in there working out exactly what the issues were to this, uh, around this um, natural disaster. I don't believe it's our role to be in there but trying to find out exactly um, what the financial impact is. I mean, you only have to read the paper to find out that stuff's already been calculated anyway. I think it's more important for us to be looking at how the emergence, and I acknowledge Councillor um, Antic and myself were members of our own CHIRP committee. Um, oh, you've forgotten what that is? No, I'm just listening to Okay. Come out. And it's more important, I think, for us to be able to get a report back that says how our emergency plans and processes were put into place and how successful they were. I think that's far more important for us in terms of if we want to do any analysis, um, that's what we should be doing, not um, taking up a huge amount of time um, with litigation or in asking our staff to find out what the value of the of the losses were. Natural disasters happen. They will happen according to the prediction on a more regular basis. Are our plans uh, and procedures that we have in place in order to respond to these natural disasters and emergencies, are they working? I would say that we responded incredibly well to them. Maybe there's room for improvement, but to waste our time uh, with with trying to political point score and also um, seeking legal advice, I just think we're barking up the wrong tree. In the spirit, in the positive way in which the state responded to this event, 
the way our own administration responded to it, I think this turns it into a real negative instead of a positive story. All right, members, um, I've got quite a few to <coughs> speak to you. the amendment on in regard to seeking legal advice. Councillor Moran. Yes, look, uh, I completely and 100% disagree with that viewpoint. Um, this is not aggressive. This is working out well, what our position is. Our rate payers regularly, if we do something wrong, flood our parts and are negligent, uh, would ask us to. Um, to um, underscore their expenses there. This is a normal thing to do. This, but by the way, this was not a, um, a natural disaster or anything. There was just a big windy, windy... We're talking about just getting legal advice, Councillor Moran. Yes, I know, but I am countering the unbelievable verbiage uh, that wasn't on the topic by the other side of the room. Um, I'm sick to death <coughs> of this council <coughs> and its leaders taking such a forelock tugging, please don't upset the government attitude. I'm sick and tired of it. We should get our ducks in order. We should know what our legal position is. We should do that. We should also work out what damage was done in our city to our infrastructure and our businesses. That is our job. We spent most of this meeting talking about stuff that isn't our job. Now we finally get to our job and we, we don't want to offend the government. It was a natural disaster. It was this. We might look aggressive. Um, blah, blah, blah. 30, uh, 23 towers went down. We're not talking about that. We're talking about finding out what the city of Adelaide is, legal position is, and the damage is for it. Now, talk about making it political. Not one of us here that have moved it mentioned political. The person that says making it political is making it political. No, we're not saying making it political, we're just finding what our position is. Now the state government runs our electricity system, so they are where the buck ends. And that, that is who we need, to, if it was the federal government running it, we would be finding our legal situation with regard to them. So it's not a matter of whether your leanings are Liberal or Labor, it's a matter of getting to the legal position if we need to get damages. We need to find it out now. We're not mentioning going to court. We're not mentioning taking out litigation. We're not mentioning that at all. We're just finding out what our legal situation with regard to losses is. In fact, seen as aggressive, good. It's a time this council got a bit aggressive. This count, this government has treated, now this is getting legal, treated this council with derision and rudeness mm -hmm. and scorn. And we deserve it because we are, we've gone with our tail between our legs, our hat in our hand, time after time. Um, and now I'm sort of shocked that this council, having <coughs> promised at the last election not to count out of the government, to stand up for them as an equal political body, to find that this is worse than the previous council, we're even more tremblingly nervous in front of the government. This is for our ratepayers and this is for our city. We weren't well treated during this. We weren't the fat first cab off the rank getting our power back and we incurred damages. I don't care how well our staff did, they did brilliantly. Of course they should and of course they would. That has nothing to do with this. The government caused this by their ineptitude and we want to know what our legal position and our damages are. That's not been rude, that's been sensible. Just uh, to note, Councillor Moran, that private sector run the power, not government, but just to pick up on that point. Well, yeah. yeah. No, no, just, no, just to clarify. Private private sector, sector, and the and the I'm, just, I'm just picking up, I'm just picking up on, on yes, one comment. It's a simplistic explanation chair of the power structure, of which I know very well. <laughs> Councillor Antic. Yeah, thank you. Look, um, I, I am quite surprised by this response. I mean, it does, it, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what is entailed by the term legal advice. I, I don't think the government, if that's who was to be offended, and I might say that there is no accusation in the motion at all, none. It is simply a request for legal advice as to whether there are avenues for compensation. It doesn't suggest that it should be the state's government or any of the power distributing companies or anyone else. It simply looks for options. And, um, you know, it just fundamentally misunderstands the process. The process is there is no point in modifying the losses. It, it may well be an insurance claim. Who knows? That's exactly the point. I mean, but we don't know that. As I said earlier, we are not experts in this area. Um, to simply have a report detailing the financial impact of the Corporation of the City of Adelaide and then um, have, have no recourse to, to legal action to recover it is a bit like flogging someone with a limp piece of lettuce. I mean, there is no need for it. It is totally and utterly pointless. We might as well scrap the whole motion. 
Um, so, uh, I mean, this is totally and utterly a toothless tiger without point two. It, it is quite appropriate. It is not accusatory. And frankly, if Councillor Kerrigan doesn't think this is the role of local government to protect the interests of our ratepayers who will foot the bill for this, in well, in the absence, if that, that was that was the suggestion, then I don't know what the role of local government is. I mean, this is entirely uh, 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 within uh, within the remit of what we're here to do. I mean, you know, it, it's anyway, it's it's staggering. It's quite appropriate. I urge members to to vote down the amendment and to vote through. We'll get our legal advice. If there is to be any, I don't think anyone's going to be upset across the road or in the power companies or in the insurers, whoever it is. I'm not suggesting it's anyone's fault. I'm just suggesting we need to have answers and we need to have an opportunity to seek compensation if it's available. Councillor Wilkinson. Um, thank you. Uh, speaking against the amendment, um, the, the way that I look at it is that the uh, you know, electronet that's owned by a multi-millionaire in Hong Kong, I believe, when the government sold it many years ago, a different government. Um, but if there are repercussions for having a, a state electricity system that's not compartmentalised and, and isn't foolproof, then they won't change it. But if they get sued by a whole lot of people, including the corporation in the city of Adelaide, for the genuine losses, then they will then spend the money improving the network. But if there's no backup, there's no reprisals for, for having not done the right thing and not compartmentalised and made, made our electricity system more secure, then, then they'll just continue to work in a bottom monopoly right now. And and, uh, and so the only thing, there's not competition that's going to change it, the only thing is that's going to make them change and spend a lot of money, which is what needs to be done, is improving our state's electricity uh, network, which is going to make us a dependable state to invest in in the future. Is, is because they're, they're getting massively sued by not just us but, but every other affected party. So um, I support Councillor Andy Exclusion Motion and, um, uh, and I think uh, we should all do that. Councillor Abbott. Just to be brief and just to bring them back to the point, um, what Councillor Antic moved, and this is why I am not supportive of the current amendment and supporting the divisions, is because. We are trying to understand the total impact on the corporation of the city of Adelaide. We're not asking what the impact is going to be across the state, across the city, across the businesses, across the residents. I mean, there's all of that other impact that we're not talking about. In essence, we should be able to have some level of support at which we can also provide for our residents if they've been impacted. I know people that are still impacted today, potentially those that have insurance, we might need to be able to support them through some of the advice we're getting on what avenues they also have our rate payers to be able to um, recoup if they've had, like I said, if they've had any impact on them directly. Um, so for me, it's about translating this to numbers, uh, which I'm certain is just the looking at the car parks alone, we're talking in the thousands of dollars, understanding what that impact is, and are we going to be passing those amounts onto our rate payers? I doubt it very much. I don't think we're going to have to do that. So potentially there is loss of revenue. And if it's loss of revenue, we need to know what it looks like. And potentially there is impact on <laughs> machinery, equipment, lighting, generators, etc., which we also need to understand the impact of. Uh, we need to also understand the impact and the cost that our staff is in place. Um, some of our staff have been working 20 hours straight, working really hard. There's a lot of cost involved in this. So the cost is not just monetary, there's also a human cost in this. And we need to be able to get all of that and get our ducks in order. Uh, for us to be able to work out what to do next. Uh, so this is uh, not a, a finger pointing exercise as much as it's saying, look, we, are, we have suffered losses. These are what the losses look like. What are the avenues to recoup them? Uh, and there is avenues, whether it be insurance uh, through some of the private companies, and we need to understand what that looks like and how we can remedy that. So we're going to ask members to support the motion, um, the substantive motion by, by Councillor Antic, and move away from this. Uh, I think it's important that our ratepayers would want to see action from council uh, where we can at least explain to them that we're going to pass the bill on to them that we did seek legal advice, that there is no remedy, and if potentially we need to pick up a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars worth of rates at the next term of rates, then this is why we're doing that and we'll try our best to remedy the situation. So I look up. Uh, I don't I'm not supportive of this and I'd ask members to support uh, the original motion.
Thank you. Um, I'm so bad. Um, Lord Mayor, I'll give you, I uh, think, <coughs> the other two councillors that haven't spoken. Do you want to speak? Lord Mayor, I'll give you an um, opportunity to sum up. Can I also just add, I just um, picked up on some of your um, feedback around insurance. Um, it might be that, uh, Councillor, you might want to consider that it's legal advice and insurance um, advice from the local government mutual so liability same scheme. Same thing, just well, then maybe they'll just take that on notice because you might need to specify that. Uh, Lord Mayor, sum up. Uh, Chair, I would come up, members, I encourage you to support this amendment. When you put the words uh, legal advice and compensation in the same uh, sentence, I think that talks fairly clearly to intent. Um, we could have contacted the LGA, uh, we could have contacted a, a number of organisations, but what this, uh, uh, the reason why I'm suggesting that we remove point two is that. Uh, you know, we would otherwise just be our first response would be to call our lawyer. Now, I'm not suggesting at any point down the track that we may, in that, in fact, call our lawyer, but not as the first response. That might come as a second response. What I'm asking for is let's get some sense of quantification around what this looks like. Then we make a more, more informed decision about what we do with that information. This. Uh, should my amendment fail, uh, would have us quantifying and calling the lawyers immediately. And I don't think, as the Capital City Council, in what has been a state crisis, is the best form of leadership that we can show as a council. I, as much as you, want this quantified on behalf of our ratepayers to see what, whether there was a loss. I and mean, quite clearly there has been a loss, but we don't know what it is. So let's get that quantified, then let's have an informed <coughs> decision-making process around what are our options then. If that involves calling the lawyers, so be it. But I think we first, I, I don't think our first response should be call the lawyers, and that's why I've suggested that we uh, delete uh, the second part of the uh, Councillor Antics motion. So I encourage you members to support the amendment as it is on the screen. Members, I'll put the amendment, uh, all those in favour? Those against. <laughs> People vote and think uh, that's carried. Uh, that's lost, sorry. Um, division. I'm calling a division. Those members voting in favour of the amendment, please rise. <laughs> the Lord Mayor and Councillor Clearhand. It's against. Declared. <laughs> Now, well, members, um, can I just um, approach members? I'm chairing and I'm talking. Uh, maybe I could just throw it out there for someone else to consider that you might want to just take seek further advice. It might bring everyone on the same page. It might be the word legal that is um, confusing. I'm just throwing it out there. Um, now, I've got um, anyone else speaking to the substantive now, bearing in mind that. Uh, Councillor Slammer, Councillor Vishaw, Councillor Wilkinson, and only three that haven't. Oh, okay, Councillor Perry. No, no? no? All right, I'm going to. Oh, yeah, right. I, I do. Um, I want to take the word legal out, so I want to move the amendment. Okay, so seek further advice, is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right, so um, that could include insurance. For <coughs> Do I have a seconder? And it has to come from oh. Councillor for sure. <laughs> Councillor Moran, quiet please. I've got Councillor Slam on the floor. Thank you. I, no, I, I certainly take the point. I'm just reading in between. I think the comment is sensible. I agree. Sorry, I have that. There's a motion for the motion. This still okay. leaves the option in the motion and allows us to look at other options. Um, we're not. What, the intent here is saying, you know, this, 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 this is insinuating that we're looking at screen and, and it could be written, no, it could be read that way. And I think I think we should step back and look at look at that. Seek further advice. Which is just actually further advice, I think. 
The operators. So, so the operators. Council Moran, please let Council Slammer. You spoke it tonight. Let Council Slammer have his turn. So. It might well be the further advice does come from a consultant or, 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 or a lawyer. So be it. But I don't think we have to write that up there. We're just going right. to do it, but not right now. So, so from an insurance perspective, there may be a way to go to the insurance company, sure. This might also be a way to go towards so the, private operator, the private operator. Right. So, yeah, right. I'm done. Councillor Vishal? Yeah. 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 It will make sense, but just that advice be obtained as opposed to legal or further, because that includes everything. That includes advice from insurance, advice from legal, advice from... I think that is the intent. Did you want to take out the word and further? It's Simply the okay, intent is to as to whether there is compensation. And the mover and the seconder have agreed to take that word further. Yep. Like to see, see. Everyone always in favour to vary that. Let's go through the variance, please, councillors. Then it will further will stay in. Are okay, those against the variation? Seriously? Uh, it's lost on inequality. Okay, so it's, so it's further stays in. Seriously, that's um, not team playing, but anyway, council for sure. Um, I, I actually think that just advice being obtained takes in the gamut and as opposed to simply legal advice. I understand the intent behind it and I don't think it accounts out in the Members, I think this should probably please everyone, but uh, Councillor Moran? No, it actually doesn't please anybody. If, as uh, Councillor Bershaw said, that she, if she includes legal advice in that, then this is just playing semantics and silly games um, to try and get some people over the line. Mm -hmm. If you mean legal advice, and Councillor Bershaw does mean legal advice, including, including legal advice, well, that doesn't say that. And the administration, uh, the Lord Mayor, you've got a lot of very against getting legal advice. You won't get legal advice. If you mean legal advice and uh, compensation in, in um, insurance advice, you put that there or you don't vote against, you don't vote for it. Because that, as uh, Jodie said, could be homeopathic advice. If you, if you wanted to change it, it should be legal and other advice. But to take legal out means you're nervous in some way about putting legal in there. Let, let's go there. Let the council solution. We get some clarity. But you're actually removing the entire meaning of number two by being scared about putting legal there when you. Okay. It, it's ridiculous, Sandy. You I'm going to get some legal advice from the CEO about what how this is going to be defined as to what advice would be obtained. Through the chair, take direction from council. But clearly, if you wanted advice, we would get legal advice, professional advice. And insurance advice and put that to you. That's practically what we would do. Okay. Okay, I'm going to ask the mover and the seconder if in brackets you'll put legal professional and insurance, including legal professional and insurance. Absolutely. Mover? As Councillor Slammer. We have a, we have a happy. Right, so I'm going to remove further, if I can take this opportunity, and put. No, no, just put advice and then put in brackets or including. Including legal, professional, and insurance. Bracket and bracket. Mover, are you happy with that? Yeah. Mover, are you happy with that? Seconder, are you happy with that? Members, I ask uh, seat leave to vary the motion. All those in favour? Anyone against? One against? Uh, right, now, uh, can I get Councillor Slammer to sum up on the amendment? Just to sum I'm just concerned that the, 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 the savings, what we're talking about here, cost of the legal advice, cost of the administration presenting another report, it's probably going to be more than, well, it's only take off the uh, carbon neutrality, you know, the amount of damage we save in those 24 hours, it's probably not going to be a lot. lot of <coughs> Members, I put the amendment to you. All those in favour of the amendment? 
All those against? That is carried. Uh, can I now go back to Councillor Antic to sum up? Oh, well, um, yeah, thank you. What, what, what could possibly not have been said that should be said? Um, Nothing, so you could just say sum up. Oh, I could, but it's so delirious that I feel like coming up with one line. No, I can't. Okay, summed up. Brilliant. All those in favour? Anyone against? Say that carried. Thank you. That's a division called, really? <laughs> Those members voting in favour of the motion as, as, amended. as amended, please rise. <laughs> Councillor Bishaw, Councillor Wilkinson, Chair, Councillor Slammer, Councillor Abiad, Councillor Antic, Councillor Moran, Councillor Martin. <laughs> right, thank you. Councillor Wilkinson, you've got another motion. Uh, thank you. It's a matter of other business. We had two items on the agenda. Item. What's your motion? Um, well, is it a I'm question just, or is it a motion? I just, I just want to put this out to the meeting. I, I could have. Is it a question or a motion, um, Councillor Wilkinson? It has to be one or the other. It's a question. Um, if you allow me just to do some preliminary thing, we no, want to talk no, about. No, Councillor Wilkinson. Is it a question or notice? Without notice, I mean? Yes, the question. Without notice. Well, it'll be a motion. It's a motion without notice? Okay. Yep. Um, that we investigate our current encroachment policy pertaining to balconies and other structures over mm -hmm. council boundaries. Returning to you, yeah. In the light. Sorry. So, could you just turn to encroachment? Uh, sorry. Um, the balcony and but, other encroachments. Balcony, balconies, and other encroachments. In the light of the capital city EPA. Which substantially increased height limits. Um, do, do you need that and that and and has rendered the current policy. Not Irrelevant, is that what you're trying to say? With current partners. Okay, hang on one second. Investigate. Do you need do you need half of that in there? Can I just suggest um, the administration investigate just the current policy. From, after height limits. Can I just take up this from there out after that? Sandy, can you just say that the administration investigate the current policy? Right? We all know what the quotient policy includes. In the capacity DPA. Obviously, okay. the obviously the encroachment policy Which pertains to balconies and the balcony. is relevant. Uh, well, obviously the encroachment policy pertains to balcony and mm. other encroachments. Remove that, and obvious we need to have that bit in there. No, it's, it's okay. so we, yeah. You want that in there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is there something? Um, I can speak to right. one second. Um, to take um, Thurston Square for example, mm -hmm. um, the. Uh, Height limits around the square was three stories. It allowed buildings to have balconies over the footpath up to that height. But we've now got height limits that are, you know, significantly higher than that, seven, eight story. And um, uh, the current encroachment thing made sense for buildings up to three stories high. But having buildings seven stories high, all the balconies overhanging the footpath, I think, is um, uh, 
it is not appropriate and, and buildings uh, about three stories should be set back and the balcony should be contained within the property rather than rather than hanging out all of that um, over, over the footpaths. So um, uh, it made sense with, with the previous items but not with the current items. Okay members, I just do the note that um, motions without notice really should be urgent. There should be um, this should be on notice, Sandy. I, I really feel to give context to it. Well my alternative I'll, was to move not to allow the um, well, you, but you did because we don't have the uh, policy is not hasn't taken this into consideration. I didn't think it was fair on those two applications to to do that, which is what I would like to do. Right. So rather than do that, I don't. I don't think that changes the context of this outcome here because mm -hmm. what members now are doing a, a approving a motion without any any administration comment on a non urgent matter. But Councillor Clarehan, a seconder. I take your point, Madam Chair. I think this is just in response to two items that we had. Things have changed. Our encroachment policies used to pertain mostly to commercial buildings. We've had huge residential um, development in terms of apartments. And our current policy, which says that you can't have any more than 50% of the balcony coming beyond the building line, you can't have more than 30% of a balcony taking up the front facade, is no longer pertinent. We really need to revisit our encroachment <coughs> policy and bring it up to line with current, um, uh, with our other building, building policy. policy. Simple as that, it? nothing complicated. Yes. And the other thing is, this is giving administration a chance to comment. We're asking them to investigate the relevance of our current policies and whether they need to be brought up to date. Can I suggest that the word investigate be reviewed? That's it, that's what we're doing. Oh, okay. Right. Anyone else want to speak? No. Summed up? Summed up. Members, I'll put that all in favour. So that carried. Uh, members, there are no confidential items, no other um, further business. I'll close the meeting. Thank you. That was a long one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do you want to encourage people to go to school? No? Okay. We've got members leaving the US, so we've got no call. <laughs> we've got a call. Oh, well, no, we haven't. We've got some local things. Okay. Yeah. 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 Can I put that in your, your rubbish trolley? You can. Thanks. Is that sitting next to you, yes, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah.
If that's uh, <laughs> Too soon. I'm chairing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we might not end up with a quorum. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 You need to be in the gallery. You told me to speak to council. You could do that. Oh, right. Right. Yes. 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 So I've lost that in writing. Okay. Thank you. I don't know when she be, um, I don't know when she be getting more She sent me an email. But if you're allowing yourself to be railroaded once, you'll be railroaded into the future. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. No worries. Okay. Okay, members, I reconvene the Infrastructure and Public Space Committee. The Infrastructure and Public Space Committee acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional people of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. Streaming. We do have a quorum. I also um, uh, I also note that the strategy plan at the, uh, the Infrastructure and Public Space Committee will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any or all contribution made to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or publicly published by the council, including transfer outside of Australia. Apologies and leave of absence. We have Councillor Cobell and Deputy Lord Mayor Hender. Apologies. Uh, confirmation of the minutes. Do I have a move for the minutes? Councillor Martin, seconded. Councillor Clareham, all, all those in favour? All those opposed? Carry the minutes. Deputation of the public forum. Deputation of the public forum. That's where you have it if you deem yeah. that you've accepted it okay. and received it. Um, we have, it's public forum, we have one deputation request, um, which I'll permit with five minutes only from Kelly Henderson on the wastewater management in the West Parklands. We have five minutes. Thank you, Kelly. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be very brief because it's already been a very long life. If I can take me first to the um, the figure 1.3 on page 7 of the agenda. The third option which is proposed for a wastewater route that would trench from the parklands, kill trees, and take it to the maximum possible length. This is just merely the preferred option. It's neither the shortest option nor the most responsible option nor the most sensible option. And I would urge members of council to not support the recommendation which asks you to support the construction of that wastewater main through the Western Parklands. If I can now take you from figure 1.3, which is quite frankly um, just appalling, and, and direct your attention to figure 1.2 at page 15. The other option, the shortest option, the option that doesn't go through the maximum amount of parklands, but instead would have to tunnel under the rail line. The report makes claims that um, the water authorities have great respect for heritage and that therefore they don't want to trench through a registered Aboriginal heritage site or disrupt the rail operation. But I point out that it is right next to and that the line connects the <coughs> construction where a registered Aboriginal heritage site was trenched over something like almost 15 hectares using a section 23 clearance and that over 9,000 historical artefacts, mostly not Aboriginal, were, came up in the buckets of the excavators. They were not retrieved by an archaeologist. There wasn't an archaeological dig. They don't have information about the layering or the positioning of more than 9,000 items from one of the most significant sites in the Adelaide Parklands. So if they don't care about 15 um, hectares, acres, what, 15 acres, or hectares, whatever, uh, then why should they care about a trench line, which is the shortest, most sensible, most responsible, most damage minimising option to address the engineering requirements. This report says the infrastructure is failing. Its option is to upgrade and replace the failing infrastructure. The option that Council being asked, is asked to support is to go around that by the maximum possible distance through the parklands, trench through the parklands, kill lots of trees, and rate the parkland as the least important. Rate that disruption and that destruction as of almost no consequence. <laughs> um, if I could direct your attention to the other option along Fort Road, that also is much shorter to direct the sewerage out into the western suburbs along Fort Road. That is also a much shorter route. A straight line between two points is always shorter than traipsing roundabout and going on a um, walkabout through the parklands. So I urge the council to require the shortest distance to be used either through the train line, train yard, or along Fort Road. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Do you have any questions from members? Thank you, Kelly. Um, Chair's verbal report, uh, Neil. Items for adoption on block. Um, Start on the paper. Bookshop, so 
we, item seven is a workshop, so we'll come back to that. So item eight is the waste water infrastructure, Western Parklands, we've just heard about. Councillor Martin, call that one up. Item nine, Adelaide Town Hall Civic Area Management Plan. Lord Mayor. Item 10, application for residential underground funding, 77 Children Street, North Adelaide. Item 11, giant pine scale identification of parklands. Councillor Martin. Item 12, commence road process to close and transfer Osmond Street to the unnamed public road east of Simon's Place, Pontland Grammar School. <laughs> Item 13, potential improvements to Jeffcott Street. Okay, so that leaves 10, 12 and 13. Items 10, 12 and 13 to be moved on block. Do I have a move for those, please? Councillor Milani, Councillor Slammer for second. All those in favour? All those opposed? It's carried. That brings us back to item 7, the presentation, proposed constructions of a new sewer main through the Westland Parklands. And we have a couple of speakers. Sophie Clyde and Simon Hartshaw to take questions on this. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, Councillors, and Chair. Um, so, my name is Sophie Free. I work in the State Building Engagement Team in SA Water, and this is Simon Hartshaw, who's the project manager for the project. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just run through our PowerPoint and then um, we will take questions at the end. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, councillors. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so what you can see up on the figure up ahead here is the wastewater network that feeds into uh, some wastewater assets that we have identified as requiring uh, upgrade to cater for future growth in the the Adelaide CBD and also provide resilience of our wastewater assets in proximity to critical state infrastructure. Uh, the project also aims to address some, some surcharging in the networks as well that has been caused by backlog of growth. Uh, as heard previously, we did investigate a number of options to uh, address uh, the drivers of the project, one of which uh, has been, uh, some of them have been heard of upgrades on the back side of the New Royal Adelaide Hospital uh, and across the train line. This site, as you're aware, is an Aboriginal Heritage registered site um, <coughs> and where we do respect the Aboriginal Heritage and therefore not looking to install new assets in this area, which would also cause great disruptions to hospital activities, the uh, rail corridor um, network and passenger tracks as well. Uh, another option that we have sought to address is uh, doing upgrades along existing assets <laughs> and through the streets uh, to get back into a net main with sufficient capacity uh, due to an upgrade of existing assets. This is quite a long process, uh, quite a long job. Uh, it would effectively take up until 2020 and beyond to complete the works. Uh, and it was thought to be undertaken in a staged approach, uh, which would minimise, uh, but would cause quite considerable disruptions to an area that is already undertaken a lot of, uh, has a lot of construction fatigue. Uh, then we have um, Sarah and I, uh, uh, a preferred option to undertake a upgrade through the Western Parklands. Um, on the outline of these works, we'll be looking to go through Park 25, um, 
uh, along by the stack of development under the rail lines into the Port Road Cold SA Water Depot through that uh, under the under Port Road through Benighton Park uh, undertake a river crossing of the River Torrens and connect back in near the uh, Benighton Park uh, or sorry the North Adelaide Part 3 Golf Course. Uh, these works, uh, we've picked an alignment that goes along nearby existing assets. We have an existing recycled water main along the majority of this route uh, that we'll look to replicate as far as possible and other infrastructure, gas and electricity as well. Uh, we have optimised our alignment based on feedback and uh, arborist reports and our impact at, as it stands is uh, one regulated tree and one significant tree. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so Simon pointed out there's tree and vegetation removal within the parklands. Um, there's also some temporary pathway restrictions or trenching. Um, we are liaising with the Adelaide City Council events team um, to make sure that we're not clashing with any major events. Um, and then we're also engaging early with DIPTI, ARTC, ACCA, North Adelaide Golf Club, Tina, and Aboriginal communities in accordance with our approved processes. Um, Reinstatement of the vegetation tree will be done in agreement with Council and the approved arborist armament. And this will be this will include a mixture of instrument turf and hydro seeding. Um, value adds are uh, also in consultation with Adelaide City Council, so our current alignment where our alignment runs through an existing old playground. Uh, so we're looking to see where we can add value in that with the council, whether it's removing it, putting it elsewhere, upgrading it. Uh, and then the overall benefits is it will remove the surcharging and over issues in CBD and then allows for that 30 year projected growth within Adland. So our timing and approval process. A project and financial approval in April and November, contract of procurement and finalisation, and then also finalisation of detailed design in December this year. Uh, hoping to mobilise to start a uh, site and commence site construction end of this year, early next year, and then completion of work for July 2017. So that's it from us. So, if anyone has any questions. We have questions from council members. Um, I, I have a question. Um, in the deputation, we had a suggestion of an alternate option that went through to streets in the western suburbs rather than through the parklands. Well, why is that option not being pursued? Yes, Sorry, this is the option that I highlighted here, which is a stage approach. Yeah. It is actually considerably longer than the proposed alignment uh, and would uh, be trudging through some uh, quite narrow streets um, and ultimately cause those disruptions to the community and be a considerably more expensive uh, solution for the ratepayers. So, keeping in mind the community and the benefits to the community to achieve the benefits that we're looking to to address, uh, it's not seen as preferred. Uh, also, there's technical difficulties with doing so. The very narrow streets, lots of gas um, works in through Everton, or all through Bowdoin and the likes as well, which would have made construction very difficult and very expensive. And what's the cost of one, the two options? Uh, in, you're talking in the realms of we didn't fully uh, cost the full stage two of the works due to uh, significant detailed design. We didn't think that it would be prudent to do so. But in that option, you're, thinking, you're talking in the realms of over $20 million to undertake over a considerable time. And now, 
for a project, uh, there's some sensitivities with the project still being approved by cabinet, but it is around half that, that cost. So 10 million to transfer the park lands into $20 million. Yes, I'm not sure as how much of it I can actually divulge in that regard. Mm -hmm. As I said, uh, our project is going through approvals with the South Australian Cabinet and Public Works Committee likes it as well. So we prefer to keep some of them. But yes, in those orders, I'm able to get. Thank you. Lord oh, Mayor, questions? Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, question. Uh, should the project proceed through the park bounds, which I must say is a little unfortunate, um, what would be your policy with the ground stand and other trees would need to be felled in order to accommodate this? What would be your policy with regards to reinstatement of those trees and would there be a multiplier applied to the reinstatement of those trees? Uh, yes, I can say that there will be a multiplier applied to it. Similar to works we previously uh, did around Hackney Road and the likes as well, it will be up to the council's discretion as to where they would like to best plant those and fitting in with the amenity of that area. Um, I can't make any formal commitments as to the numbers and everything like that at the moment. As I said, the project is subject to approval from the SA Cabinet. And I don't have the power to make those approvals, but we're looking to work with council to ensure that any amenity that we uh, disrupt or anything is improved. Councillor, Chair, just oh, one more question, Chair. Uh, what is the projected time in terms of uh, from commencement to completion of this project? Uh, we have commenced, uh, so in the timelines that we provided there before, it's about six months total. Uh, and so we, we're working with uh, to stage works to minimise the impact in the life of this work. Thank you. Councillor Slam, and then to Councillor Clarehan. Well, you mentioned other infrastructure like water and gas currently going through the line of the park lanes. Do you, um, am I assuming that this is going to be a common trench approach? Uh, no, those assets are, are existing there. We're not putting new assets in with ours, they're existing, but they have been disturbed previously, so we'll be in alignment, matching out the, the, the spacing that we need from those assets. There's regulations around how close you can be to gas and electricity and things like that as well. So, so, so there'll, be, there'll be three separate alignments going through the apartments when this is done? There's already two or three. There's a, a, recycle, a recycle water yeah. and there's gas currently installed through that area and electrical infrastructure. So the area that we're targeting to go through has been previously disturbed for the majority of the, the, the infrastructure. That's Clara Hamm. Which leads on to one of my questions about um, gap water. We, I don't know how many years ago, maybe six or seven years ago, we had gap infrastructure um, installed around the park lands. Um, and council now uses gap water for a lot of its water. Um, is that infrastructure owned by SA Water as well? The gap water, yes, yeah. yes. And the charges yes. for the gap water, are they determined by SA Water? I believe so. I, I can't comment on that. I'm not the <laughs> regulation and the, the, uh, just in the capital delivery space. So. Okay. Um, so, so any, any questions yeah. I've noticed, I'm just going to give I guess the reason for that question was in relation to, well, maybe it's not just about tree replacement, but it also might be about being able to negotiate a reasonable cost for our gap water, um, given that a lot of the parklands being used for the installation of the other infrastructure. Just one more question in relation to the, um, an issue raised in the presentation. When SA Water trenches for in, to, to, to lay infrastructure, um, happens with any of the artefacts and things that are unearthed during that time? Is there is there someone that you have in attendance during that trenching? Yeah, good question. Uh, we have a, a standard operating procedure for the discovery of any uh, 
Aboriginal artefacts and whites as well, and we have a very good relationship with the Aboriginal community. Uh, our heritage team are liaising with the, the representatives and the likes as well. And again, I can't make commitments to this because this is all government uh, agreeing as to what the community wants to do in regards to monitoring any of the works. But typically, for installations like this, we have Aboriginal monitors on site watching the excavation and, and we'll stop work if anything is uncovered. That's fantastic. And just one more question. What about the uh, more recent artifacts? What happens uh, to European heritage? Yeah, yeah look, again, that's all covered in our standard operating procedure. Also, our contractors all go through inductions for identifying the artifacts and things like that. Uh, we've done searches through the area and nothing has um, has come up on. So you've not come across any of the prior dumps that were scattered around the park? Uh, yeah, so we, we have been uh, we have been advised by the, the park lands being for use of dumps and that as well. Um, we're doing we're geo looking to do geotechnical investigations to see if there's any issues like that. So we suppose of anything that comes out it's a risk that we're taking and we we've got procedures and policies to do it. And work with your people in regards to stockpile management. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Item eight. Thanks to item eight on the same topic, wastewater infrastructure, Western Parklands, Councillor Martin. Um, Chair, I, I move this principle. We have a seconder. Yes. Councillor Slama. I'd like to speak to your motion. Um, Chair, look, I, I don't think there's any need to. The uh, the background paper uh, addresses uh, most of the issues. I am satisfied with the information that was provided in the presentation, uh, and I'll accept as printed. That's the final and second. Any other comments, questions? Councillor Clara Hack. Yes, um, just a a question of administration. Given given the cost of our gap water, is there any opportunity for um, a re, for some sort of acknowledgement of the um, cost savings resulting from installing the infrastructure through the parklands, um, as to given the amount of money that's been saved by taking that route? Is there any chance that we could negotiate some uh, cost reductions in terms of what we pay for gap water? And if so, is it possible to put an amendment that administration enter into discussions with SA water pertaining to um, reduction in the cost of our gap water? Uh, through you, Chair, uh, the negotiation for gap water cost and supply agreement was just recently negotiated um, uh, like last year um, for a period of five years. Um, but uh, staff are having continuing dialogue with us over water in regards to uh, gap water, its, it's uh, supply, its quality, um, and uh, what the future looks like in regards to um, increasing use of gap water. I think it's really a discussion to Focus on the, um, what you put forward to our cancer plan in regards to the overall benefits. Uh, does it require, through the city chair, does it require an amendment to put it on the table? Or. CA? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Through the chair, we can certainly take it on notice. You can put it as part of the recommendation if you like, but if not, you can take it on notice. I think I'd like to put it on the recommendation that um, given. Given that the majority of the, well, no, I won't say given. Um, negotiations regarding the supply cost of gap water be revisited for future contracts, given cost savings to SA Water. by traversing the parklands. If that makes sense, I'm happy for someone to amend it appropriately if um, they wish. 
Do we have a seconder for that? Um, capital G, capital A, capital C, please. Okay. A seconder for that amendment. Or I can ask the uh, move and second if they'd like to adopt that. Will you second that? Will the mover and seconder include it? Uh, will the mover and seconder accept that? Would you be prepared to bear in the motion? Well, my only concern is that it's a specific issue. It's a yes or a no. But it's related to this. Yes, except that I mean, the park has always been crushed by an act of the South Australia. Chair, you need to declare that it's lost and there's no variation. It's not a discussion point. Yeah, it, I'll, I'll take that as a no. Right. To that place. If there's anyone else would like to second that? Um, okay, well, the staff may take that. I'll read a motion on those. Yeah. There's also questions about the quality of the gap water that is put onto our park bands that could be enhanced by the saving that's being afforded to SA Water if this passes through council in terms of extra filtering, <laughs> etc. Um, so, uh, any further discussion before I bring back to the mover to sum up? Sum up. All those in favour? Well proposed, that's carried. Thank you members and thank you for the presentation. <laughs> Item 9, Adelaide Town Hall Civic Area Management Plan. Lord Mayor. Uh, Chair, given that uh, Adelaide Town Hall is 150 years old, we've been provided with a 212 page report that contemplates a range of matters. Um, I'm going to move a motion. I'm, yes, I'd like to move a motion to defer this to a workshop. <laughs> I'll see a second. Second, Councillor Clarahan. <laughs> move for deferral. Seconded by Councillor Clarahan. No, I, I, it's just um, this, this report contemplates a range of matters yeah. which I think have been suited for this. It's not business critical in terms of time emergency. It doesn't. Uh, uh, retain our ability to get on with that valuable works around the Queen Adelaide room or anything like that. Um, nonetheless, it's very important, and I think given its gravitas, uh, it deserves a workshop as opposed to coming straight to committee and then to council. So, in that room, members, I suggest we go into the workshop, we discuss it in detail, we have Andrew Clinky here with us, and then we, uh, then we have questions and it comes back to committee and chamber there. Do we have anyone who would like to speak against the deferral? I'll put it. Those in favour? Those opposed, that matters deferred. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Item 11, giant pine scale identification of the parklands. Councillor Marsh. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Look, I'm moving as printed. Seconder. Um, but I have a question. Yeah. Some of Do we have a seconder? Councillor Slam to second. Councillor Marsh. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, look, I, I have noticed the, uh, the fencing, and in fact, I actually thought it was to protect people from the possibility of falling branches during the, uh, the recent storm, but apparently not. Um, uh, I'm quite happy with the recommendation that the matter be essentially uh, left in the hands of the CEO, but I wondered if I might have some undertaking that if there is anything approaching the Dernan Court experience where 85 trees needed removal, that it would come back to council. At the moment, we're talking about possibly four, I think, or maybe slightly more. If it's slightly or substantially more, then I, I do think it's something about which I would like to have a discussion. Yeah. Yeah, through the chair, yeah. Look, obviously, we need to deal with the impacted trees because not dealing with impacted trees, I understand, okay. and I enable it to spread further. Um, and yes, certainly, if we, if we were to remove the identified trees or those trees in that area, immediate area, I think we should be doing that straight away, and I'm happy to report back to you if it, if, um, if it goes above and beyond that substantially. So, so we'll do that. Thank you, I'm happy with um, I have a question of the administration. Um, the Alipo pine, which are magnificent trees, um, would there be a plan to replace them with Alipo pines as opposed to replacing them with that? Uh, uh, native trees. Uh, through the chair, um, perhaps if I could just introduce the gentleman ne next to me, mm -hmm. Rodney Purser, um, both from a uh, division of uh, biosecurity SA, 
and David Hubbard, who has been doing all of the inspections in the parklands, who's now looked at 1,400 trees in the parklands, and um, Nick Seacombe. So I think um, well, we've got a couple of individual trees, one in the golf course and one in um, the Adelaide Oval precinct. Uh, that's a little bit more straightforward, but we've got four along the front road frontage in part 12. And they're a group of 10 there. Um, and at this stage, that's all we've identified. But um, uh, David might be able to explain a little bit further that there will be ongoing monitoring in the whole area um, to make sure that once these trees are dealt with, um, that we don't identify anything else around the place. So, do you want to have any comment on that? Allow best to speak. Yeah. Chair, so um, currently our. Uh, our knowledge of the insect and its um, lifespan and, and its persistence within the environment is that we would recommend that uh, you not plant a uh, pinus species in that particular area for an extended period of time. Um, so we would anticipate somewhere between a year, um, depending on the treatment of the area. Uh, obviously, there's a risk in putting a, a pine back into an area which is obviously infected. Uh, so uh, if that was a, a different option, it would be a preferred option. But if there was a, a need to put a pine in there, we would, we would suggest somewhere between a year and two years, possibly, before anything is replanted in that area. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Beth? No, no, thank you. Okay. Councillor Bashaw. Thank you. Uh, just a question, because um, uh, I don't know much about insect populations. Um, given that there's been quite a large removal in Dillon Court, how, how is the insect sort of moving and do we need to do something with the councils to make sure that even if we remove those trees, <coughs> that the infestation doesn't come out? Chair, through you, yes, good question. So um, to date we've relied on some direct inspections to find what we've found, but also um, the general surveillance, so letting uh, council staff, arborists and the general public know about this is really important means of reporting back. At the moment we've got no indication that this is connected to the Burn Court um, section. We, we've done some trace back to see if there are any uh, obvious connections between the two sites and are. But it is very important, and, and that's how this um, uh, detection was indeed made through the council and arborists being aware of the situation. So, absolutely, we would encourage arborists to be made aware of the council staff to be made aware of the arborists that might be out there, but have been reported. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, Mr. <coughs> Chair, so can we do something in terms of just upping our communications surrounding councils? Through the chair, um, I've already notified all of the arborists that we um, deal with uh, within the city, with the Botanic Gardens and some other uh, players. We've also spoken to the Stadium Management Authority where the original tree was found and we've been fully on board with all of this. So um, we're asking for everyone to keep their eyes open um, and um, identify, if they do identify this to please let everyone know because um, capture and, and uh, treatment, as we are discussing, is, is the way to go at the stage. And I have a question, like if you can. Yes. And does that include um, private, your research on private properties, given we have got some quite large uh, open spaces in some of the um, private properties? Uh, yeah, Chair, uh, yes, we're certainly looking at any uh, private uh, property that have got pine and uh, recording to look at those as part of our surveillance work. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, take back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Summed up, thank you. Okay, I'll put that. All those in favour? All those opposed? That's good. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen. That brings us to item 15 on the agenda, other <coughs> business. The Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Hender is, is away, but I understand that Lord Mayor is authorised to move on her behalf. A motion on notice, state of the park down with Lord Mayor. Thanks, Chair. I understand uh, this is quite permissible, so uh, Deputy Lord Mayor has asked me to move this on her behalf. Um, members, you, I'll, I'll take this as read. Second to Councillor So I Clarehan. seek a, uh, I, I seek a second. Councillor Clarehan, second. Okay, I'll only speak very briefly, members. I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, it looks to really uh, us to, uh, and I'm sure we've probably got this data. So we're just seeking on an annual basis to quantify parklands gains and parklands losses. I think it's an entirely reasonable request 
the Deputy Lord Mayor is asking. Uh, I personally support it, so I move it on behalf of the Deputy Lord Mayor in her absence. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And the second is Councillor Clarehan. Councillor Martin. Um, look, Chair, I, I will support this. Um, I am disappointed that Councillor Hender isn't here. Um, it, it will unquestionably serve as a catalogue of which parts of the park lands are disappearing. And uh, let's face it, about 25% is already gone from the days when the park lands were planned. Um, and it looks like we're still going to lose more if the draft park <coughs> management strategy is adopted. We know there'll be at least five more buildings and by my count, many more. But um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that out of this also comes a discussion and it started in the confidential session that we had that led to this proposal that we actually have, and I think it was Councillor Clearahan who proposed it, uh, another uh, list. And that is a set of targets uh, in relation to the parklands. It's all very well to have a catalogue of what has disappeared. But accompanying that catalogue should be a list of actions that commit this council to the preservation of targets of parklands. So that, in terms of the discussions that we've been having, a percentage of open woodland and biodiverse environment is committed to as worthy of preservation. So if it stands at 30%, then this council would say, we will commit also to preserving 30% of urban woodland and biodiverse uh, habitats um, as well within our parklands uh, strategy, or better still commit to increasing it by 5% over say the next 10 years. And uh, on top of that, uh, I'd like to suggest that we could do better by committing to other targets, like for example, uh, every time uh, there's a new development in the parkland uh, area, that, uh, or areas at least, uh, we are quite content seemingly to agree to a splash of asphalt here and there uh, to provide car parking for those developments. Now, a, uh, an initiative that would assist uh, and would complement this uh, motion of Councillor Henders through the Lord Mayor would be for example, a commitment to reduce the level of car parking on the parklands. Um, catalogue how much it is and then agree to a reduction in that space and a return to parklands of areas which are currently being used for car parking. So it becomes a, a, a strategy that not only captures what has passed, uh, what returns to parklands, but also develops um, the notion that we can actually actively commit to uh, targets that will ensure not only the preservation, but in my mind, the, the extension of the parklands to uses other than uh, uh, the ones that we're contemplating in, uh, in some of our strategies. So I, I support I support this motion. I, I will vote for it, but I do ask that perhaps uh, my fellow councillors consider. Well, maybe we need enough national uh, Consider the uh, the obvious extension that this proposal of council of hands. Um, if I may speak quickly from the chair, um, I think the term that you're referring to, Councillor Martin, is hard stand, which includes bitumen areas, seal areas, as opposed to um, lawn and garden. Um, and I think it's also worth us looking at areas which have been rezoned from parklands to possible um, where parklands have actually been lost through rezoning um, as well. Um, so can Lord Mayor, back to you for saying. Thank you, Lord Chair. I think the risk, I, mean, I think we're getting into a myriad of debate points yes. there. I think let's yeah. just focus on the uh, matter we have at hand, which is uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor's motion, which just seems like we support. Um, the having a sense of quantification annually uh, in terms of um, uh, how we're progressing with our parklands uh, and putting a quantum around how much parkland space we are either gaining or losing or neutral, I think it would be very useful for this council. I think it would inform you know, many other things. So I think at this point in time, members, we'll just focus on what we've got at hand, what, what we have at hand, because it's precisely this. I commend you, I think it's a very good motion on behalf of the Deputy Lord Mayor. 
I put that. Those in favour? Those opposed, that's carried. And uh, we have um, uh, no items uh, seeking exclusion for the public. I now close the meeting at 8.50. Thank you. Thank you, members. Thank you, members of the public. Chair. Chair.